I believe this will be catastrophic for Bitcoin, both as a currency and as a fledgling industry. If this is a hoax, it is one that I am fully blindsided by. I fear, however, that it is not. With these words, blogger Ryan 2-Bit Idiot Selkis sent shockwaves through the global Bitcoin market. The documents he had received, which had been circulating among concerned investors for some days, would soon prove authentic, sending the price into freefall. It was worse than any of Mt. Gox's many detractors could have feared. As much as 750,000 Bitcoins, worth more than $300 million, were missing from the world's largest exchange. What had begun at the start of February with an unexplained suspension of withdrawals would end swiftly with the Japan-based exchange's sudden filing for bankruptcy. Just weeks after Bitcoin had exploded into the public consciousness, setting new highs above $1,000 for the first time, the exchange responsible for more than 80% of global trade had been hacked and taken offline, its future uncertain. For critics, the event was proof Bitcoin's promise of a digital money system, free from the woes of traditional banking, was a pipe dream. Regulators would grow alarmed at what they saw as a system lacking consumer protections, holding hearings around the globe. Wells Fargo, the first bank to consider Bitcoin services, would shut down a pioneering internal program. Forever etched in the minds of many would be the headlines that heralded the end of Satoshi Nakamoto's experiment and images of a stoic Mark Karpelis, the cherubic 29-year-old CEO whose homespun approach to operations turned the company into a honeypot for hackers. Indeed, for the some 120,000 customers who lost money in the collapse, the pain was real and lasting. Some were shut out from hundreds or thousands of Bitcoins, life-changing wealth that would vanish as swiftly as it came. Others would embark on a still ongoing fight to retrieve reparations, only to face hurdles and setbacks time and again. But out of the ashes of its biggest test, Bitcoin would emerge stronger. Early users who had turned to the exchange, the first to bring something like traditional order book execution to the sector, became its latest wave of emboldened entrepreneurs. Gemini's Tyler and Cameron Winklevoss, Shapeshift's Eric Voorhees, and Kraken's Jesse Powell would all start new exchanges, building back a global trading network stronger and more resilient than that which came before. Still more innovators would turn the page on old industry models altogether, building products and services that would enable users to take control of their digital wealth in ways never before imagined or possible in any financial system. Seven years later, the incident remains a reminder of the perils of centralized systems and provides evidence for just how far the technology and its services have advanced since its earliest days. On February 24th, Bitcoin Magazine remembers the fall of Mt. Gox. Welcome, 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 everybody. Uh, if you're tuning in, uh, this is Pete Rizzo, editor at Bitcoin Magazine, editor at large at Kraken Cryptocurrency Exchange, and host for the special edition Bitcoin Magazine live stream uh, with my co host here, Matt O'Dell. Matt, how's it going? What's up, Pete? Let's fucking go. I know, right? This is some history. We're living uh, really one of the, I think the word that someone used yesterday is gravest moments in, in, in Bitcoin's history. At least that's how I feel having lived through it. Uh, of course, we're going to bring bringing on, you know, experts, people who, uh, you know, lived it, uh, lived through it. Um, what's your take on that? I mean, it was, it was an event that really shaped um, early Bitcoin uh, that couldn't really be avoided. Uh, it was a... It was the exchange. There was no other exchange really that had that kind of volume that that Mt. Gox had at the time. Um, and I know as as an early Bitcoiner going through that, um, you know, I, I I got introduced to the space like right before the collapse. Mm -hmm. uh, it really shaped my thinking going forward and how I proceeded through the space. And I feel like the newcomers nowadays right. they miss that. They don't they don't have that that example to them. And and we see it on a day-to-day -day basis where they don't really appreciate the custodial risk. So I think this is more important than ever. 
Yeah, I guess when you're talking about the legacy of Mt. Gox, really, that's what we're talking about, right? This is a story that, that we as Bitcoiners tell. We've told it for years, and, and we're telling it again this year. And there's a reason for that, right? There's there's lessons. So maybe, Matt, you want to talk a little bit about uh, some of those themes where when you think about Mt. Gox, um, you know, what goes through your head? I mean, the big one is not your keys, not your coins. Uh, I I literally... I, I don't I try and explain the gravity of of that that situation that 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 truth that mm -hmm. absolute truth that not your right. keys not your coins the newcomers because they don't realize like to me even if I have you know I any money I have on an exchange I just assume isn't that I'm never going to see again like that's the mm -hmm. assumption I operate on and it's not my money until I pull it off and I don't think people really appreciate that. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, obviously, you know, a lasting lesson for custody, you know, in the intro, we went over 750,000 Bitcoins were lost in the collapse, uh, you know, hackers still never caught, uh, exchange uh, still in legal proceedings, still many customers trying to get something, uh, you know, from their accounts, whether it's dollars on the Bitcoins or, or some of the Bitcoins back. And, and, you know, this is seven years later. Um, you know, obviously a, a story that's impactful and uh, have pushed the technology forward in a lot of ways, right? Uh, I guess the question I would ask you is, uh, you know, what improvements that you see uh, do you think are the results of, of what happened with Mt. Gox? Well, I mean, I think we saw a lot of, uh, of the background processes that these exchanges use, these custodial services use improve. Um, I mean, Mt. Gox was an extremely amateur operation. Uh, so, so, so we have seen them improve. And, and basically what happened was, uh, you know, Mt. Gox wasn't the only uh, exchange that got hacked, wasn't the only custodial service uh, that lost uh, customer funds and owner funds. And what happened was basically anyone who wasn't doing uh, best practices, they all got, they all got hit, right? And, and, and slowly and steadily, the, the ecosystem matured. Um, I, I think ultimately, though, what we've really seen is we've seen improvements in, in self-custody and collaborative custody that allow users, um, whether they're a, you know, just an average pleb or if they're a big institution, practice their own custody and not rely on another, on, on another, another company to do it for them, another person to do it for them. And that's absolutely important. Like the ease and the, the, the ease of storing coins yourself has never been easier before in Bitcoin land. Right. Yeah, it's come a long way. Of course, we'll be unpacking that over the course of this live stream. We've, we've got you for three hours, three plus hours, uh, you know, lots of great content. I'll be interviewing uh, Bruce Fenton next. We'll be getting into some of the history of early Bitcoin exchanges and Mt. Gox. Uh, Matt, you'll be having uh, Parker Lewis talking more about that self-custody angle, you know, what it means to take custody of your own coins. Uh, CK uh, Christian, uh, Bitcoin Magazine editor, uh, will also be on talking about that. And lastly, we'll, we'll be doing a, a wrap up a session. Yeah, I think the other thing that I would mention is, you know, um, obviously the lasting lessons from Mt. Gox, you know, you've got self-custody, uh, you know, we figured out different ways of what it means to be a Bitcoiner, but just a great story, just a great, just a great story. Unfortunate, right? It, it really did impact a lot of people's lives, um, but you've got Mark Carpellis, you know, you've got this uh, kind of big, stocky, nerdy guy wearing a t-shirt, uh, names his business after a cat. Uh, you know, who is the only guy with the keys to the Bitcoin for the exchange. The employees are begging him to let them, you know, run it like a normal company. And he's busy setting up like a cafe downstairs. You've got, uh, you know, uh, you know, people, uh, creditors, you know, they flew. They flew to Japan. They, they stood outside the office. They like with protest signs. Right. This was this was front page news. And I think with people, you know, it's not just, uh, you know, for the for those who lived it. Right. There is a cinematic quality to the Mt. Gox story. Of course, no movie yet. Maybe we'll get there if enough Bitcoiners, you know, when we take over Hollywood, uh, we'll get the movie going. Um, yeah, you know, I think that's what, for me, that's what I remember is really the story and the drama uh, and just, uh, you know, how that just absorbed the whole conversation around Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, it, Bitcoin was really in the Gox shout up for a, for a long time afterwards. I mean, right. I remember people, I kept confusing, you know, did Bitcoin get hacked? Bitcoin's easy to get hacked. Right. Uh, you did mention the cafe, which was just a hilarious side story of the whole fucking thing. Um, another thing was was the Roger, the famous famous Roger video, where it looks yeah. like he has a gun to his head, saying that mm -hmm. they were fully capitalized. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it hit so many different people in the space of all different levels uh -huh. uh, that there was so much um, 
there, there was conflict of interest. There was so much conflict of interest. You had tons of people that had lots of money on the exchange that were saying, everything's fine. Everything's fine. Everything's mm. fine. As this whole thing unraveled. Mm. Um, and I, I'm, and I remember like when Selkis broke the story, like he also announced that he sold his Bitcoin <laughs> and he said it could be the end of Bitcoin. Right. Bitcoin was trading yeah. at $800. Right. Yeah. That's the other like, thing. We like sit the timing, at $50,000 you know? right now. Mm -hmm. That's how, it was the timing too. Right. I think that's the other thing with the Malgox story. Not only is it silly, not only is it sad, but you've got the, the epic timing, right? Bitcoin had hit, uh, I said in the intro, broke through in the public consciousness, right? You hit twelve hundred dollars. Bitcoin went from you know ha trading at a few dollars to start twenty thirteen, trades over a thousand. It's in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Nathaniel Popper is writing digital gold. This is big business. <laughs> and then two months later, Mark Carpellis and his cat. You know, this one guy with this bad computer. Uh, you know, uh, realizes he's got no bitcoins anymore. We'll be getting into the play by play of that story with Bruce here in a few minutes, but. Uh, yeah, just uh, the timing, right? It really just did take the wind out of the, the sales. Um, I guess, like, you know, a question I would have for you, and, and I'm sure we'll unpack this with other guests as well. Do you think that there could be something, you know, an exchange hack or, or just any event uh, in the future that would be as impactful as that was? Maybe not as impactful, but I mean, we're due, I think we're due for a big one. People have their guard down, you know, everyone is just like, uh, just on cloud nine, not really considering it as a risk anymore. They're like, oh, this space is so professional and we're just going to have one really big one. Maybe there's maybe a, in this time, it'll be like a government will be involved with it, you know, uh, because that's a custodial risk. People don't think about that. A government could come in and shut someone down and then you can't access your funds. But I mean, it just feels like it's got to happen, right? It's at some point it's going to happen. I don't think it'll be as impactful as, as Mt. Gox. I don't think I'll ever you know, remember a stranger's cat's name eight years mm -hmm. later? Like, how, how, how is that yeah. still up here? Yeah, yeah. He is the most famous cat in Bitcoin, after all. Right? <laughs> Probably one of the most famous cats in the world, period. Yeah, and uh, uh, sadly, he passed away last year, I think, if I remember correctly. Yeah, so that's uh, another great Bitcoiner lost. Um well, great. Yeah, of course, we'll be taking questions, um, you know, and engaging with folks. Uh, we're streaming right now on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. So everywhere you're getting great Bitcoin Magazine content regularly, uh, you're getting this feed. And we're here for three hours. If you have questions, uh, you know, if you're new, uh, you know, we really want to get this Im the immediacy of this event to you, right? We want to we wanna help you understand the story, why we still remember it. Uh, as Matt just said, uh, why we still remember the name of this guy's cat, uh, you know, seven years on uh because really this was big for bitcoin it is still big for bitcoin and and you know not just because people lost bitcoin but because the innovators were inspired uh you know people really did the industry did change after this uh you know there is a before and after mount gox and, and those are different periods in bitcoin's history looking forward to it we have a great stream planned for you guys i hope you enjoy it and find it helpful many places to buy Bitcoin. They collect your personal information and jeopardize your privacy. KYC is the illicit activity. BISC is open source. It does not collect user data. You keep your private keys, create or take offers to trade peer-to-peer, -peer, and keep your Bitcoin private and secure. Welcome to the Bitcoin Twitch channel, hosted by Bitcoin Magazine. I'm Don, one of the co-hosts of the Marble Show. Join myself, Flip, and Tommy for exciting marble racing simulations and talk about the latest news in Bitcoin. We also run giveaways and promotions that dole out sweet, sweet Satoshis. 
Follow and subscribe to the Bitcoin Twitch channel. Have fun playing games with other Bitcoiners, and maybe you'll find yourself with a few more Satoshis in your pocket. If you're just tuning in, this is Pete Rizzo, editor at Bitcoin Magazine, editor at large at the Kraken Cryptocurrency Exchange, and host for this special edition Bitcoin Magazine live stream. Today, we're revisiting the legacy of Mt. Gox and the early history of the Bitcoin economy to discuss. Uh, we're joined right now by Bruce Fenton, managing director at Chain Stone Labs, co founder of the Satoshi Roundtable, and former board member at the Bitcoin Foundation. Welcome, Bruce. Thanks a lot, Pete. Good to see you. Awesome. And it's great to hear you, too. Uh, so we got a lot of listeners here out across uh, Facebook, YouTube, uh, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Um, Going to give a little bit of background to start before we jump in. If you're new to Bitcoin and you're just joining us in this bull run, welcome, welcome to the revolution. Uh, first off, uh, but a little background of Mt. Gox. You know, we, uh, Matt O'Dell and I were explaining this story, but want to dive in a little bit of the specifics. Uh, so Mt. Gox uh, started trading. Uh, you know, Bitcoin obviously started trading with zero dollars, right? There were no exchanges like Coinbase and Kraken today. People traded Bitcoin peer to peer. Uh, for goods and services. Uh, MT Gox started out as an exchange for Magic the Gathering cards, right? MT Gox, Magic the Gathering exchange. Uh, but in 2010, its founder converted it to a Bitcoin exchange. Uh, so Mt. Gox eventually grew to be over 80% of the volume uh, for Bitcoin trade at its peak. In 2014, Mt. Gox was hacked and lost nearly 750,000 Bitcoin, worth $350 million at the time. The event rocked the industry, spawned scores of regulatory conversations and shaped headlines for years. Uh, and finally, uh, you know, Mt. Gox did propel a new wave of innovators um, to the industry uh, and to the exchange space, uh, to custody solutions, and, and really did help push Bitcoin forward in many ways. Bruce, what was it like uh, to live through the days of Mt. Gox? It was uh, wild. I mean, I like how you say it rocked the industry. I mean, it was it was just a really big deal. And it was um, it was such a shaky time. Bitcoin was so uncertain and such a you know, small thing. There was very little professionalism. There was no real institutions. I mean, even even lawyers and and certainly investors, venture capitalists were were you know mm -hmm. very hard to find. So this. Well, I remember was the, you were the guy the at the Bitcoin conferences with the suit. That right. was you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I was considered a real uh, you, you know Wall Street suit. And, you know, people, early people were like get out of here. We don't want you. You're kind in the, in Bitcoin. <laughs> Well, let's uh let's start off and uh, maybe just get into it. Um, can you explain? You know, what was it like to trade Bitcoin when you started, right? So, what were, what were people doing? Were they using exchanges? Uh, maybe set the scene. What year was it? And, and you know, were there big exchanges yet when you were getting involved? Yeah, when I first started uh, learning about it in 2012, it was it was a lot of peer to peer, and it was just very weird and experimental. And you know, you'd hear yeah, about you'd people show doing... up to somebody's house and you'd give them a stick of gold and they'd give you some yeah. Bitcoin, right? Yeah, and there was people doing, uh, you know, trades with with paper wallets and and um, 
you know, over like, uh, you know, chat boards, you know, and they mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. almost semi public kind of things. Mm -hmm. I think if you and I've seen some from from, you know, um, earlier than that, that that had people doing these huge transactions like, hey, I sent 150,000 coins. Did you get it? Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. I got 100,000. But I sent 50,000 back because of that mm -hmm. laptop that you gave me that time, you know, mm -hmm. the, these funny kind of huge numbers. Mm -hmm. yeah, and there, there was, was people was on local around, Bitcoins trading but, too. Yeah, I was digging around uh, uh, pr pretty recently. I, I found a Bitcoin cash by mail service. You would actually put cash in an envelope and send it to some guy <laughs> who would send send you Bitcoin. But, you know, the exchanges were a big deal when they came out, right? So so people didn't have, it wasn't easy to buy Bitcoin online whenever you wanted. You did have to find somebody. Uh, maybe something you could speak to, Bruce. You know, what was just the attitude towards those early, early exchanges? Because when I look back at it now, uh, it seems that people did trust those institutions. Uh, and, you know, when Mt. Gox did have those issues, you know, it was quite, it was really, Really shocking to people. Yeah, it was. Um, Mount Cox was very, very trusted, and uh, you know, it, like you said, eighty percent of the market. I mean, which was for, for some people, it was it might as well be a hundred percent. I mean, it was kind of like the 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 thing. I mean, you just think about how big Coinbase is now or Kraken. Um, I think together maybe they're eighty percent of the market. You know, so so Mount Cox was a very, very big deal, and it was it was a different time. You know, there wasn't a lot of awareness about the you know, problems with centralized institutions. I mean, that was one of the ultimate major lessons from Mt. Gox, but um, people weren't aware of that then. So it was it was just this centralized thing that people counted on and they said, wow, this is a much easier way to buy and sell and hold Bitcoin than, uh, you know, all the steps that they used to have because just, you know, months before that, it was it was much harder. You had to go meet people in person or or whatever they had to do. Why, why do you think Mt. Gox was the biggest? I, you know, I think we explained a little bit of this, but there were alternatives, right? There was B2C China, uh, you know, early exchange founded by pioneer Bobby Lee. There was, you know, BitInstant, Charlie Schrem's service. Uh, what was particularly attractive to Mt. Gox? And when you think about 80%, right, 80% of the trade, there had to be, was there something there that really Mt. Gox was the best place, easiest place? I would guess, I think it was pretty easy. And I think there was good volume there. I mean, huge volume. Uh, compared to the others. And it was, you know, ironically, it was considered reliable. People thought, well, this is the biggest, this is the, you know, they don't need funding, they're rich, they've got a lot of Bitcoin, they know what they're doing, they handle everything. That's where you go if you, mm -hmm. if you want to go where, somewhere trustworthy. Mm. You know, ironically, so, you know, that, so let's it, it's, set the it's scene. Do you, do you remember where you were when, when you heard that Mt. Gox had lost all of its Bitcoin? I, de I definitely do. Um, it was an evolving process, and it's, and it's an interesting story. It seemed that Gox was getting very shaky, and I remember talking to people. I can't take credit for it. I was just basically listening to smart people, which is what I try to do. But but people that I thought were very very smart and very credible um, at the Miami Bitcoin conference. I think I think it was Miami. Um, were just saying, "Hey, this is a, this is a house of cards. It's it's going to mm. fall apart. It's a total mess." Mm. And I believe it was, I believe it was some months before that. Um, I had the idea that Gox, it was clear that they were kind of a mess. And I had the idea that maybe a professional firm could come in and just help them out. I thought it was bad computing and maybe some management improvements or something like that. So the best company I knew who does that kind of thing is Bain Venture. So I called a friend at yeah. Bain Venture. I said, hey, is this the kind of thing, you know, would do, this, this, it seems like a great opportunity. I think this could be a billion dollar company. You ought to fix it. He said, I don't know. That's probably not our thing, but I do know a guy who you ought to talk to. Uh, his hmm. name's Barry Silber. So, ah, and Barry was not very well known at all. I mean, nobody was well known. It was mm -hmm. like kind of pre crypto. Yeah, there was no Twitter. There was no, there was, uh, you know, there's basically no, nowhere to go to, to meet other Bitcoiners, really. Exactly. It was so, it was a tiny, tiny industry. And you know, Barry had a, had a solid Wall Street background. And I talked on the phone. I said, hey, I wonder if, you know, I just kind of shared the idea. We didn't do any formal thing, but we, you know, I kind of like, oh, I wonder. And um, so I got to thinking about it. And then I, I decided to investigate a bit more. And I, uh, I ended up talking to, to Mark and uh, oh, really? Gonzague um, okay. at, at, at Gox. So we, we ended up talking on the phone. And I said, um, I said, hey, you know, I have a sense that maybe you need a little more professional management. I, you know, it's, I'm not a VC or anything, but I just think you have a good opportunity. I think you could be a big company. Do you think maybe, you know, you, you would, you would, you could get some help. And he's like, yes, I, I think, you know, that might be a good idea. 
okay, I, I will think about it kind of thing. Is that Mark's voice or is that Gonzague's? I, I, kind of both. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I don't actually it, know what Mark Carpella sounds like. I don't, I, I never met him. Sort of similar to Gonzague, you know, mm -hmm. kind of a calm, sort of like very emotionless, kind of soft spoken manner. And then about two days later, uh, two bit idiot, Ryan Selkis had this story and he said like the, basically i think the coins are gone or highly likely mm -hmm. to be gone and i i went i think on twitter or somewhere and i said that that's ridiculous <laughs> that's just that can't Famous be because i had just talked to i think i had just talked to gonzague just a few days earlier mm -hmm. and i said hey what's up with the because there was speculation i said hey what's up with these problems he goes oh you know there's technical things that happen from now and then you know he very mm -hmm. downplayed right so so anyway, so got Ryan came out with this thing. I'm like, that's just ridiculous. So I called back and I believe I couldn't, and I'm, I'm trying to remember this story exactly, but you know, it was a while ago, but I, I believe I couldn't get a hold of Mark, but I think we did get a hold of Gonzague. And I said, what is, is this true? And he was like, yeah, you know, I think it kind of is. I'm like, <laughs> wow. Wow. I'm like, so that was his reaction to that... losing 750,000. Yeah. And I said, I said, I said, for one thing, didn't wasn't that kind of material when we were we were just talking mm. like a week ago? I mean, <laughs> when you say problem like techie problems, didn't you you kind of downplayed it? For one thing, I go for another thing. I said, do you realize the magnitude of this? That people are going to be losing their life savings. Right. This is a huge, huge, huge thing. And he's like, yeah, yeah, we are very sad. Mm. And I'm like, well, let me let okay, me add some, little, some context there or what? Because uh, I think we jumped ahead. You know, we were talking a little bit. You know, yeah, sorry. comes <laughs> out. Uh, you know, they're the big order book exchange. They're kind of pioneering this idea that you can exchange Bitcoins online without out meeting somebody. Uh, but, you know, as you mentioned, the problems were pretty long standing. Right. So th there was a period in which uh, I think there was a discussion and a mystery about what was happening at Mt. Gox. I remember over the summer of 2013, there were divergences. Right. People were asking, why is the price of, of Bitcoin twenty dollars, thirty dollars higher right. at Mt. Gox? I think I remember you know, at some times it was $100, right? And people were wondering, is this the new Bitcoin economy forming? Or is this just, you know, the many exchanges and their price differences? Uh, you know, there was a lot of uncertainty, uh, but mostly whispers, right? People didn't didn't quite know. So I, I guess when, so it really sounds like up until the point, uh, you know, there were concerns, but those weren't confirmed. And people still thought uh, that Malcox uh, could be saved or that, that it was, you know, it just needed a little polishing, it sounds like. Yeah. I mean, at least, I mean, you know, I think the people who dug, I didn't dig in very much at all. It was kind of a couple of phone calls and it sort of went south from there, maybe, maybe due to timing. But I, I do think that any of the real serious folks who dug into it more than 10 hours or so, I think that they probably got really, really concerned. And that's why there was a lot of buzzing and whisperings about people who kind of knew what they were talking about, auditing type, you, you know, smart technical people who had really, really grave concerns. So so that was, you know, at, I think by the time the Miami conference was around, I remember I was sort of like, wow, this, this looks like a really serious problem. And I thought maybe it was like, maybe they just had a, a bad wallet thing where it would be locked up for a few months or something. So it, it wasn't just a certainty that it was as bad as it was, but it looked it right. looked pretty bad. Yeah, it's the Mt. Gox story has this Titanic quality to it, right? Where it's, I think people knew that there was something wrong. There was observable, you know, the exchange, even in February of 2014, you know, they declare bankruptcy in, in late February. At the beginning of 2014, people couldn't withdraw their coins. There was right. weeks that were going on. I, I think Coindesk at one point, uh, you know, I, while I was a reporter there, they did a survey. Uh, and I think 70% of the people <laughs> who reported being Mt. Gox customers uh, couldn't withdraw. Insane. I mean, could you imagine that 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 today? But people still, you know, at the time there wasn't, was that really when the red flags or I guess when, you know, what was the point for you? It really sounds like it was this conversation or these conversations around that time. Yeah. I mean, by b between, at, at that point, I knew two bit, I, I, I knew Ryan's stuff was dead on. So mm. I, I, I did a, a 180 in, in a day. Mm. And, um, and then we kind of joked about it later because because he, he thought I was lying. I thought he was lying. And then we both realized that mm. that he was right. Um, but uh, but but that was, you know, it was just for like a 24 hour period. And then it became at least mm. clear to me by then. I believed it. Uh, I, I believed it in the sense I believed it was a, a total mess. And I figured that it was 
mm. you know, kind of what it was. Um, but but then but most people I think there was people who were in denial. I remember talking to people being mm. like, oh, you know, I, I got bad news for you. I'm afraid it's gone. And they'd say, mm. no, 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 Bruce, you don't know what you're talking about. Well, and I think the other thing is there are some pretty well-known people who had money and lost money in Mt. Gox. Right. I think uh, one of the most famous ones for me is Eric Voorhees, who went on to start his own exchange at Shapeshift, uh, you know, was publicly, you know, said uh, should have known better. Right. And that he takes responsibility for having the funds there. But of course, he's not the only one. Uh, though I think he's spoken uh, spoken about it. Um, do you have a sense, I guess, for for how many uh, people, uh, how many people ended up being sort of inspired by this to to, to take action, and uh, you know when maybe that started to happen in in the aftermath? You know, it's an interesting thing. Uh, you know, whatever set of miracles has made Bitcoin what it is, Mt. Cox has got to be part of that, right? You know, it's a piece of the, it's an important piece of history. So in some crazy way, maybe this was a good thing because mm. it sure as heck taught people and really instilled a very uh, different culture. It was a culture shock for many people. Uh, and it and maybe a minority of the people, you know, cypherpunk geeks that uh, sat there and coded and nobody listened to all of a sudden were like, oh, wait a minute, maybe these smart people really are smart and maybe we should listen to them. And mm. I think that that's, you know, I don't know, you could you could speculate, you know, some of the most valuable voices in our space, I think, are those who call for security and decentralization and owning your own keys. And, you know, you just go through the, you know, the kind of smartest, best people mm. to listen to in the space. And I, I think that, you know, the, the Mt. Gox um, uh, experience was a, a really, really powerful learning experience for a lot of people. Are, are, are you, uh, I guess, uh, you know, when you look at that uh, aftermath again, um... Are you surprised at, at how long it took the, the space to recover at all from that, right? Because I think we were talking at the beginning, just the shadow of Mt. Gox, uh, you know, the, and the headlines and the weeks of headlines. And maybe you can talk a little bit about that reaction, uh, because I think it wasn't just the surprise in the Bitcoin community. Uh, there was really a, a larger story, and, and, and in many ways it introduced a lot of people to Bitcoin as well. Yeah, it was not just months. I think it was years of headlines, really. I mean, just... Um it was a big, big negative. And it was 100%, you know, people didn't understand at the time to, to differentiate between Bitcoin and exchanges. So people would just say, hey, what do you mean Bitcoin? That got hacked. And you say, no, 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 Bitcoin didn't get hacked. Oh yeah, it did. And then you'd, and that would be a whole discussion. And so it was a, it was much earlier in the learning process for that. So people didn't, mm. you know, they, did, they just didn't, didn't really get right. it. People thought Bitcoin you know? was hacked, right? And that was one of Mt. Right. Gox's things, right? Is 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 Mark Harpolis, uh, you know, publicly blamed the Bitcoin protocol for a lot of their errors? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. What was the um the transaction oh. malleability? Yeah. Yes, uh, yes. Mark. Transaction malleability. Yeah, so I, I guess error. just to set the scene for new people here, you know, this this exchange, uh, you know, Mt. Gox, largest in the world, ha you know, it basically their security issue was that uh, their hot wallet was was being drained by hackers and it basically had being uh it uh you know had been in the process of this for years right so you know you ask the question is how do you lose 750,000 bitcoin that's question number 1 but then the other question was how do you not know <laughs> that you lost 750,000 bitcoins right we're talking almost 121 you know on 1 million uh coins right the percentage of the supply but really uh, you know, the story uh, appears uh, from what we've been able to piece together in the past that, uh, you know, about the past that, uh, you know, they were hacked. They were infiltrated early on in the life of the exchange. Uh, these hackers still still at large, still at large. Right. Uh, um, you know, we're just taking coins out of the wallet. Uh, the Mt. Gox officials were refilling the wallet, thinking that this represented customer activity. Uh, and that it appears that that just had went on for years until until they realized it. And then, of course, you know, we don't know all the details of the story. Uh, and it seemed like they did a lot to cover that up and, and to hide that from the industry. Um, and still kind of fascinating that it took that long. Yeah, it's stunning. Well, I guess like the question that I would have from you is, um, you know, did you have a sense back then that, that it would still that the recovery process would still be going on at this point? Right. We're seven years from this event. Uh, people are still waiting uh, to get some recourse from the legal system. Did you have a sense really that it would take that long at the time? I don't recall. I, I thought it was really, really bad. And I thought it I was I was pretty pessimistic about it. I said, boy, this this is going to this going to upset a lot of people. I know people and heard of people who just left because all their coins were there and they lost all their coins and they're like, screw this stupid thing. And they left. Mm. And then they got bitter when it right. went up later. 
And, uh, you know, so they, they're, there's a lot of sad stories that you hear and some anecdotal and some, you know, just, but, but overall it was a very dark, dark thing. And I think, um, you know, CEOs and professionals who were trying to build businesses probably had to address that objection, you know, hundreds and hundreds of times, you know, it'd be interesting to ask somebody like a Brian Armstrong, you know, in his journey to be, go from a, you know, startup to a big company uh, mm -hmm. in those years, how many times did he have to address that in those years? Or, you know, probably 10 times a day for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Everybody, wait a minute, what about, what about, you know, how, how come this isn't going to happen? And it, and so it, it took a lot for, for the industry to kind of outgrow that shadow and they haven't mm -hmm. entirely outgrown it as you said mm -hmm. do you think the efforts to help preserve mount gox from the industry you mentioned your own phone calls with with mount gox you mentioned your conversations with other industry leaders at the time about it do you think the efforts to help the exchange were naive in retrospect oh yeah probably <laughs> i mean it was sort of uh I'm kind of an ideas guy and I just thought it was kind of a cool idea. And like I say, you know, I, th these people certainly didn't commit to anything. It was just kind of like, Hey, you know, I had this theory, like, Hey, maybe, maybe this is just something that you need some more professionals to fix it. Uh, but like I say, I think after just even a couple hours of digging, it, it looked like it wasn't, it wasn't doable. And I'm sure any, any real professional, if you, if you did proper due diligence, it would have, it was so bad. I think that anybody would have, you know, I don't think you were, you had to be smart to uncover it. I think right. anybody could have uncovered it if they just, you know, if you went in and w walked in and looked at the books for just a couple minutes, um, you know, I don't think it would have fooled anybody. But yeah, so it was, it was probably certainly naive. I was just kind of hopeful that, um, you know, I like to fix problems and stuff. And I was kind of, and I've seen amazing things done. You know, you can have real mess of a company. Uh, you know, my my thought was, hey, as long as the coins are there, they can fix the tech support and they can fix it. But, you know, obviously, if the coins aren't there, then, right. you know, all bets are off, unfortunately. Right. right. Yeah. Interesting. I, I guess looking back, the question I would have for you also is um, just thinking about how big that was, how many people it touched in terms of just losing Bitcoin, how many regulators got involved, how many how many people entered the conversation. Um, do you have a sense whether something, an exchange hack or, or something else? could be that big today? Do you think there could be something as catastrophic as that, uh, that affects as many people today in today's market? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly possible. You know, um, exchanges are single points of failure as an entity. Now they've, you know, hopefully done a very good job. And from what I understand, they obviously spend, they spend a lot of resource and a lot of technical efforts to make sure that they protect about uh, against these things. But unforeseen risks are unforeseen risks. And that's just a, a, a factor that you add, you know, you add an extra layer of risk when you have these central parties. So there's certainly very, very, very large exchanges that are on the, you know, a failure of one of them would be on the scale of a Mt. Gox type of disaster and would be, you know, hmm. maybe a similar impact to the industry. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I wonder about that. I don't, I, you know, it was so early within Bitcoin's history. Mt. Gox was, was such a big part of the market. Um, you know, if I think for me, it's, it, I think it's hard to imagine because as you mentioned earlier before, people really did equate Mt. Gox's ha being hacked with, you know, there being fundamental problems with Bitcoin. And I think for a period of years, uh, it was unclear, you know, whether that trust with the consumer market would would come back. Certainly, you know, this was the start of a couple year bear market where there was, you know, uh, the price of Bitcoin thereafter would go down to a low of, of less than $200. And it was really was a big confidence uh, blow for the industry. But, you know, out of that, we did see improvements, right? So the exchanges today, I, I think are, are better, right? We learned, we learned a lot. And maybe you can talk a little bit about, you know, what are the differences you see in today's exchanges versus the exchanges of the past? Yeah, just a much different level of professionalism. Um, you know, I, I thought it was great when I first heard that Andreessen Horowitz had invested in, in Coinbase because I said, wow, th that's a quality outfit that is not going to put, in my opinion, is not going to put their name on it as a venture capitalist if they don't have some degree of confidence that it's not going to be a gox. So I figured, you know, and I, I certainly don't have any inside information on it, but, I, but presumably, you know, uh, Andreessen Horowitz had very smart people look at this and they, they assessed the risk that it was worthwhile from a business standpoint. So that, that spoke, spoke to me. I thought that was great. I, I said, well, that, that's good. That's a new, definitely a new level of professionalism that we're going to have. It's going to be built like a real company. I mean, you know, because, because remember, you know, the difference between even a tiny Silicon Valley startup 
that's backed by real VCs versus Gox is just night and day. You know, mm -hmm. Gox it was not a professional company. I mean, it had commingled funds with the owner. It was run like a like a like a Magic the Gathering store. You know, it, it had all kinds of weird things and he had private keys and and then he, he apparently worked on a on a, a, a coffee shop in the first floor mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah, you know, so it's just kind of Bitcoin payments. <laughs> yeah, it was a weird little tiny mm -hmm. business run like a very tiny disorganized small business in some ways, like a solo practice in some ways or, or, or a, uh, you know, solo proprietorship. Um, mm -hmm. One of the other notions I think that has evolved pretty considerably uh, since then is this idea of self-custody, right? We'll be talking a little bit about this coming up uh, as we get into the program. Uh, Matt O'Dell will be talking uh, with Parker Lewis coming up about that, really getting into self-custody. Uh, but maybe you could talk about what did what was custody like back in the day, right? Because I don't really remember us talking about uh, self-custody, right? You just downloaded the Bitcoin software, uh, you ran the wallet, and and there wasn't really the same idea that we have today that you need to take personal responsibility uh, to protect your Bitcoins. Yeah, I think people thought of it differently. I mean, I think a lot of people were kind of experimenting. It obviously didn't have the value. You didn't you didn't have a lot of people with like a hundred thousand U.S. dollars worth of Bitcoin. I mean, that would that would just been a weird. They may have had uh 10,000 bitcoin or something but <laughs> but but it was it, in in dollar terms it, it was just rare to, you know so you heard these stories of like oh wow that 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 so and so was an early miner and and you know th their coins are are, are worth $100,000 now and that was a those were big numbers you know for the earlier people and then it became a million dollars um you know i remember hearing about the first bitcoin whales um you know people were speculating that that folks like Roger Veer they're like Wow, he is probably a millionaire of Bitcoin, mm. and that was very uh, shocking and impressive back back then. So, when do you think you actually self custody? Like, if you think about this concept that we have now, you know, knowing that back then there weren't these products, right? There wasn't the ledger, there wasn't the the Trezor, there wasn't uh, you know. There, where when did you when did you take custody of your coins in your in your mind, and how is that different from from using an exchange back then? Well, I think most people. Um, were using things like Armory or they would use just the regular Bitcoin wallet. What was, what was Armory again? Armory was was backed by Trace Mayer and as I understand was branded as a very, you know, solid, good wallet. From I don't, I'm not a very technical person from what I understand. It was a, a good, solid wallet. Um, I, I think it was a little bit harder to use than, than most wallets um, from what I understand. I, I, I think that you know, people kind of used the regular Bitcoin wallet and people would print print things, you know, you could use paper wallets. I remember um, messing around with paper wallets before. I always thought they were really fun because you could you could kind of print a piece of paper and have a key on it and you could have a backup mm -hmm. of it. And, um, you know, but, but I, I think a lot of these things were just kind of experimenting. People weren't thinking of it as real money in the early days, probably. Mm -hmm. um, but, but once Gox cr crashed and, and, uh, you know, I don't know when I first heard anybody say, not your keys, not your coins. I think it was Andreas was the first person I heard, but I, I would imagine it was probably quite a bit after Gox. I'm just guessing. Mm. But I, you know, I think that that, um, I don't know, I, you know, some of it I've only heard secondhand, but, you know, I can only speculate, but I, you know, I, 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 it must have had a big effect on the psyche of Bitcoiners and Bitcoin holders to, mm. it, to move towards self-custody. I mean, it just, they, they just, there's just this people, people were either goxed themselves like you mentioned, some people became who, a verb. Yeah. Or or they heard about somebody being goxed and they're like, well, I, I don't want that to happen to me. They know it's a bad thing. Even now to this day, it'd be interesting to find people who've been in this space just less than six months. How many of them would know that term was or, or know about Mount right. Gox? That'd, that'd be interesting because right. I bet it's a decent number because it it's such a legendary. It should be. It should be a legendary lesson because if you don't learn it, then it will happen again. We don't want that. Yeah, certainly very interesting. Of course, taking some questions uh, online right now. We're streaming out to LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, or Facebook, uh, chatting about the history and legacy of Mt. Gox, once one of the largest uh, Bitcoin exchanges. So big, it was synonymous with Bitcoin. Uh, so large, it lo uh, lost a supremely uh, meaningful part of the supply <laughs> of Bitcoin uh, without knowing it. Uh, and really, you know, over time has, has become the story we pass on and and tell uh, again and again. Um, I, Bruce, in your opinion, you know, what is it that, that people really find so fascinating about the story and, and, and why do you tell it and how do you tell it these days? I can't speak for others. I mean, but I, I think 
for me, it's what it's a fascinating. Um, you mentioned the Titanic, or it's sort of a train wreck. I mean, it's a very sad tragedy, tragic, but also, you know, ultimately, I, I mean, you can't say Bitcoin failed because of it. You know, so maybe it didn't help Bitcoin, but Bitcoin has certainly done okay. Uh, and I maybe think on a, on the bright side, maybe partly the reason that Bitcoin is so strong now is because the Bitcoin community and Bitcoin holders took a beating. And from that beating, they got a valuable lesson in centralized parties. And I think it's also fascinating from kind of the train wreck angle, you know, well, well, tragic. It's just sort of a, just a fascinating thing to think about that number of coins, which was even a lot of money then, but now it's just astronomical. Um, and this just strange, it will never be repeated. I mean, you, you know, like you say, you know, even if there was a very big failure now, it wouldn't be at the scale, but also you wouldn't have the the just baffling, strange story, this bumbling kind of, you know, strange character, set of characters in a very amateurish way. And, you know, I don't mean to just, just demean any, anybody involved or whatever, but it was, it was just a, just a, you know, it's just such a, you make a great film. It's just mm. a, such a fascinating, weird thing. Yeah, I think I think what's uh, interesting too is we just you know I think we know so little about that event looking back, right? I think there were there were a lot of employees at Malcox too, right? I think there was a, a, a peak maybe about twenty or thirty employees and who really you know many have gone silent, I'm not sure if they've continued in the industry, uh, but but really haven't told their story or have told their story in bits and pieces, um, and and obviously you know we know what we know, but there are still missing parts of the story, right? Uh, at the end of the day, you know, they lost 750,000 Bitcoins, which is something we talk about, but someone stole those, those Bitcoins. Someone sold them on other exchanges, perhaps. Someone maybe still has them. I think one of the other interesting uh, things out there is that we, we don't know uh, what happened. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was such a question mark for so long, and there was all this speculation, oh, they think they're going to track them down, and and then you'd hear these silly rumors, you know, oh, they found 350,000 of the coins in Hungary and then they're going to release them. And yeah, right. You know, this this nonsense and, uh, you know, lots of speculation. And, you you know, these kind of things you'd hear at conferences, people be like, oh, I, I heard a thing that says that, you know, the FBI has it and they're going to yeah. they're going to let everybody know. It's always just rumors for years and years. And then I think finally people got tired of hearing the rumors. And so I, I haven't heard any in a few years, yeah. but. I remember after it was there was always speculation about it, but it, you know, like it, it's still a mystery, and eventually people get tired of speculation because that's all you can do. Hmm. Do you stay up to date with news about the recovery process and and, and what's going on with the claims uh, for the customers? Not really. You know, I, I I find it sad that it's it's so hard to follow because it seems to just always change parties and change. Uh, you, you know, official sources, and it's not a clear or easy thing to do. And so I think that's probably frustrating for a lot of the, the claimants where some people just kind of give up because they don't know how to track it or, or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, because it's, I mean, it's been an awful long time. And as I understand, there was still like 200,000 coins left or something. Mm -hmm. So, right. it, I mean, the, the fair and right thing to do would have been to just redistribute it, which is why Bitfinex is such a, a, an amazing success story because right. they had a huge hack and it was a problem, but they immediately were transparent with the people mm -hmm. and they said, here's what we're gonna do. And we're gonna try, we make a lot of money. We're a good exchange, stick with us. Here's what we did to fix it. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we, we're gonna share the profits with you and give you all the money we have until we make it whole. And they did, right. and they did. And then people made out on top of that. Well, they, they and, tokenized their, 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 their debt. So they, they tokenized yeah. the loss. Uh, they distributed those tokens to users. Uh, and you're right, they bought those tokens back at, at, the, at the value and, and people were made whole. Yep. And a lot of people made extra because I think you could convert it into something or whatever. And uh, um, yeah, so everybody took a haircut and then, and everybody's in it together and they said, all right, we're going to fix it. And uh, that was an incredible thing. And, and it's a, it's a testament to the free markets, you know, unfortunately, um, especially by Japanese law, you know, Japanese bankruptcy law is, is extremely convoluted and obviously has taken forever and eats up a lot of money in lawyers fees and things like that. And that's, right. that's unfortunate. What do you think the best case scenario is for claimants for people who seven years later still haven't gotten the coins from the exchange, probably won't get the coins from the exchange? 
Yeah, you know, I've heard that it's, I, I mean, the best case would be if they just distributed the coins based on a pro, pro rata. I don't, I understand that's very unlikely or impossible. I'm not an expert on the rules, but the, you know, smart folks seem to think that that's not, not the case. I do understand that there seems to be a good chance that they will um, base it on the on the U.S. dollar value of, at the time, or something like that, and there and and it can be set. I, I, I've heard this explained a couple times, and I think Carpalis even com confirmed it that there it could be settled in such a weird, convoluted way where it says, okay, these people are owed X dollars to make them whole, but it's whole as of U.S. dollar value at the time of the hack, and then here's the assets, and it ends up cashing out in such a way that basically the, the company. Uh, ends up with a, all the Bitcoin minus this tiny, U, I mean, it's like, okay, you pay out 280 million or 600 million in US dollars, but you have, uh, you, you know, w w whatever, 200,000 Bitcoin, um, billions and billions of dollars. So, so th th apparently there's a, some chance that it could end up that way. And I think Carpalis could even end up in control of it. Have you heard that? I have, right. Yeah, I think under Japanese bankruptcy law, it, it might be possible for him to recover some of those assets. Um, it'll be interesting to see what he do, uh, that he's done. I know that he's spoken about Mt. Gox since it collapsed, and he's expressed sorrow and, you know, has, has made his public apologies. Um, you know, do you have a sense, I guess, for, um, you know, uh, I guess, are we ready to forgive Mark Carpellis? Is, there, is that something that we as an industry should do? I can't speak for anybody else. I forgive him. Yeah, I think, you know, look, it was early. I think, uh, you know, obviously people have different takes on that. Uh, you know, I, you mentioned sort of the mystery and, and the intrigue around Mt. Cox and, and in many ways still remains, right? We're, we're talking about this recovery process and, you know, we'll still hear rumors in the press uh, every now and then about, about how that's going to be handled. Um, but we'll see. You know, I think uh, it's it's certainly a chapter of, of Bitcoin's history. Uh, certainly one of the ones that uh, you know really says a lot about the times back then, right? Yeah, um, it sure does. And 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 it's and it's not over yet. You know, we don't. I don't think. I mean, we haven't had the resolution of the of the case. And I mean, there is this chance. Imagine if because because Mark said that I think he said he doesn't. He certainly doesn't want to profit from this. I mean, in some weird happenstance where he ends up with a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. But imagine if he did, and then he and then he he did the pro rata and sent it out to everybody. I mean, what a chapter that would be. I mean, but that's why I say. I mean, he he certainly paid. Uh, he went to prison, and he paid for his his. Uh, and it's not even really, it's not like he hacked it, uh, which would certainly be fair prison sentence, but I think it might have been, you know, pathological incompetence almost, mm. you know, just just sort of yeah. just a just a baffling, uh, very, very strange, uh, terrible level of negligence, which is which is different than 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 malevolent intent, you know, it's close. Well, I think um, I think hey. Mt. Gox, you know, it was a humbling event, right? Uh, we were yeah. coming off all the success, a, a year of the industry exploding, uh, Bitcoin entering the consciousness, entering the mainstream, and it, and I think looking back, um, we didn't think at the time that it was as early as it was. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the things that have happened since then are just you know, mind boggling. So so it's always it's always good to try. And and I think you're you're doing this. It seems that you're trying to collect these histories because you've got to look through the lens of what it was then. Mm. You, you know, you know, it's 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 funny. I, I mean, even even saying like a term like OG, you know, mm. which you describe in this in this thing, it's kind of like, well, it's just like somebody who saw a movie before the other person saw the movie. You know, mm. you saw it, you saw it because your 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 buddy's friends with the director, and you got to see it like two months before it was at the release. You know, it's just sort of happenstance to, but 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 it is fascinating to have observed observed if you if you were watching or in those early days because it, it's such a different lens. You know, it wasn't considered a professional thing. It was just this weird jokey. I mean, for some some brilliant people just saw it exactly as it was, but the number of people who take credit for that versus who actually are it's a very small number i mean a lot of people's thinking of, has evolved a lot and there was a lot of common thinking back then of kind of like um you know stuff that would be considered very very silly now you know yeah. and uh, so it's evolved a lot does this change i guess when you speak to people today and tell them about exchanges you know how, how do you how do you tell them to think about interacting on an exchange 
you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a minority among a lot of Bitcoiners in that I, you know, I'm more friendly to the idea of custody, mainly just because I come from a world of professional custodians. And there's reasons other than, you know, I don't, I don't trust central banks and I don't want to trust re regular banks, but sometimes trust of some sort, you know, like trustees, um, you know, I've worked with a lot of trust departments and law firms and stuff, and they do provide a valuable service. You know, it, it does make sense in some cases. And I've also seen all kinds of strange things happen where somebody gets brain damage or somebody gets hurt or somebody dies or something like that. And people end up losing assets or don't know where things are. And, you know, there's a lot of drawbacks to, uh, you know, to, to, to self-custody. I mean, there are, there are trade-offs either way. Some people sort of like 100% on the self-custody side, and that's certainly fine. I support anybody on any spectrum, but either side should be aware that there are different trade-offs. You know, you, you could potentially be, um, you know, subject to, to physical, uh, you know, threats or something like that, or, uh, you know, there are other, other risks. And, and you got to remember the world is complex. You want to make your, your plan, you know, war proof. If there's a war, you know, I, I've, I've known people in wars and, you know, all of a sudden you're just, your home is gone or your business is gone and you want to plan for that kind of thing. You know, having some private keys in a, on a, on a steel wallet buried in your yard is not mm. that clever when it, when you're talking about major disasters and things like that. Um, and neither are, you know, obviously neither are centralized organizations. They can be shut down for all, any number of reasons, government intervention or anything else. Either one is, is, is a big trade-off, but coming from the, you know, sort of investment space, just from a practical angle, like you take corporate treasuries now, we're all excited about corporate treasuries. They may self custody for, as a company, but I'll tell you right now, there's no treasurer as a human mm. being who's going to take that responsibility, not if they're in their right mind. I certainly wouldn't. If I was, a, if I was some uh, corporate treasurer and they say, oh, Bruce, you're the Bitcoin guy. Do you wanna, you wanna have, have the private keys for the billion dollars or, or do I wanna be, you know, a, a three of five. I don't want to be anything. I don't want to be anything of anything in that. I don't want any part of it. I don't want to have some responsibility like that. It just seems to be a huge, uh, a huge attack ve vector, huge risk. Mm. Um, so I just look at it a little bit, a little bit different because I've, I've been, I've been a money manager, and I never ever had to worry about anybody robbing me, even if mm. I manage hundreds of millions because. Uh, you know, the money was held at Fidelity or something. So I, mm. but I, and I don't ever want to be worried about it. So, mm. so I have a little bit different, you know, probably a more friendly view to the idea of custody, but I really do like the idea of the things that like uh, Casa Hoddle does, you know, Jameson Lop right. and, you yeah. know, the ideas of more sophisticated and easier ways for people to, um, to, to, to have their own custody with, mm. with some safety uh, backups in place. Well, Bruce, we're talking about the history of Bitcoin history as part of this uh, special edition of Bitcoin Magazine live stream, uh, you know, Legacy of Mt. Gox. Uh, last question before we turn it over to uh, Mr. Matt O'Dell and, and Parker Lewis to talk about self-custody. Uh, you're the director. Mt. Gox is the movie. Is this a comedy? Is this a thriller? Is this a, a suspense film? What's your take? Oh, boy. I love that. I, you know, I, I'm a huge movie guy, and I went to... Um... I call it film school. It was really a certificate program, but just certificate program doesn't have the ring. So when I talk to my kids, I call it film school, even though it was just a little thing, but I love movies. So I would probably say I would go for a little bit. Uh, there's a movie called Midnight Run that that was an old De Niro movie, and it's kind of half suspense, half funny. I'd go mm. for that sort of uh, that sort of balance, sort of, you know, you got to have some goofy moments in there because this space is goofy, but you know, you could also have a little bit of the edge of the sea, you know, pro probably nothing too violent or anything, but I think it would make a great movie. Bruce, thanks. For, thanks for joining us. Where can people find out more about about you and, and, and follow all the great information you're putting out? Uh, let's see. I'm on Twitter and um, uh, Watchdog Capital is, is our company and uh, Chainstone Labs. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm pretty easy to find online. And um, this is great. It was great to see you and, and a real pleasure. And it's, it's, uh, it's a great thing that you're doing trying to, um, you know, preserve these memories and, and teach people uh, from a new generation of, of kind of looking through that lens of how, how strange things were. You got to pass the lessons on Bruce Fenton. Thanks for joining. This has been Bitcoin History. This is uh, part of our legacy of Mount Gox live stream today on Bitcoin Magazine. Stay tuned. Next up, Mr. Matt O'Dell and Parker Lewis, Gox, self-custody and more. We'll be right back.
there are many places to buy Bitcoin. They collect your personal information and jeopardize your privacy. KYC is the illicit activity. BISC is open source. It does not collect user data. You keep your private keys, create or take offers to trade peer-to-peer, -peer, and keep your Bitcoin private and secure. Welcome to the Bitcoin Twitch channel, hosted by Bitcoin Magazine. I'm Don, one of the co-hosts of the Marble Show. Join myself, Flip, and Tommy for exciting marble racing simulations and talk about the latest news in Bitcoin. We also run giveaways and promotions that dole out sweet, sweet Satoshis. Follow and subscribe to the Bitcoin Twitch channel. Have fun playing games with other Bitcoiners, and maybe you'll find yourself with a few more Satoshis in your pocket. How's it going, everybody? Uh, welcome to, uh, I mean, you've been watching. So welcome to this Bitcoin stream. Thank you for joining us. Big thank you to Bitcoin Magazine for hosting. Um, I do have the live chat in YouTube up on my side. So if you have questions while we're going, uh, feel free to shoot them in there and I will try my best to address uh, any questions you have. Uh, I know Parker enjoys this subject a lot. So uh, I expect him to be very insightful here. Um, What's up, Parker? This is Parker Lewis uh, of Unchained Capital. Uh, he's also a very good friend of mine, and he's joining us here to talk about the importance of self-custody. How's it going, Parker? Pretty good, Matt. It's just retweeting the, uh, that we were on right now. So always enjoy coming on and, and joining one of Bitcoin Magazine's daily streams. Um, seems like the, you know, I think last time I was on one of these, it was the happening. Um, and, and yeah, happy to be here. Um, always game to talk self custody and also, you know, as you led into, um, it's good to see you old friend. I can't wait to, to, to see you guys in person in Miami too. Yeah. I expect you to be there. We're going to have a fucking blast, um, to anyone listening. If you haven't bought your ticket yet for the Bitcoin, uh, 2021 conference in Miami, um, you can use code humble all caps for 21% off, uh, and you should consider doing it. It's going to be an insane party. I expect 200 K per Bitcoin. Uh, during that conference, uh, so it's going to be fucking lit. Is and, it? Uh, it I think it's gonna is be it not sold time. out? Is it not sold out yet? It's going to be soon. I really, I, I know that yeah. sounds like a marketing thing, but it's not. <laughs> I'm super pumped. I got, I got so excited when I knew that it wasn't going to be in LA and that it's going to be in Miami. So um, I'm thinking about road tripping it too. So, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm pumped for that. Fuck yes. Um, before uh, before we get started here, I mean, so this is the anniversary of Mount Gox. Uh, seven years ago, Mount Gox went down and people lost a lot of money. Uh, they thought they lost a lot of money. It turns out they lost way more than they, they originally thought because the price was around $900 at the time. Um, and now it's, it's around 50K. Uh, so it's significantly more. Um, I think that's an important thing people should keep in mind is that we should be thinking in terms of 10X 
uh, 20x, 30x uh, of what you're currently holding uh, when you're talking about security because Bitcoin is a crazy beast uh, that will keep most likely keep going up in price is what a lot of us expect. Um, so with that said, I think this stream is super important for people because Gox is kind of a distant memory. Um, for some, it, they, they weren't even a part of it. And people seem to be using custodial services more than they used to. Uh, you know, in the aftermath of Gox, like a lot of people learned their lesson because they got burned and, and there was a big push away from custodial services. Now it seems we have a ton of custodial services popping up, not just exchanges. Um, there's interest bearing products, stuff like that. Um, and it turns out that the, one of the easiest ways to make money in this space is to offer a custodial service. So there's a lot of conflict of interest where you have people recommending these things to, to new newcomers and they're not aware. So this stream is extra important to, you know, hopefully, so, because the, work, the best way to learn is to get, to get messed up yourself, but I, ideally we don't want that to happen. So if you are watching the stream, you think it's helpful, please retweet it on Twitter so we get more reach on that, uh, just so that we can hit the newcomers. So with all that said, Parker, Gox was before your time. Um, as someone who wasn't around when Gox went down, what is your, like, how do you feel about Gox? What, what is Gox in your mind? It, it was a, a great learning example that I'm glad, you know, happened before kind of I was around. I think that's one thing that, you know, I think each person, everyone always feels late to Bitcoin, but one of the, one of the reasons why the network is growing as quickly as it is, is because, you know, because it's decentralized, because maximum accountability is pushed to the edge of the network and to the users, everyone is maximally accountable and responsible for themselves and that you, you learn from past mistakes. It is, it is, you know, there's no central point of failure. It is trial and error. And as more people come into the space, I think across the board, not only is there more infrastructure, but there's more people, there's more people that have experienced things in the past. And one thing that I think is fairly consistent amongst Bitcoiners is they not only like to help people understand Bitcoin, but then they, they, they want to help prevent their errors from resurfacing. And that doesn't mean that all errors won't resurface, but that um, many people are forced to evolve because they've been burned before and others that come after them, like myself, um, either you know, kind of fall on two sides of the fault line, which is make those same errors or adapt and never, never be put in that position too. And so I think that the comment that you made, Matt, and it's something that I, I heard on the route of recap long ago, but this idea of always having your security posture be 10x the price of Bitcoin. I think that's that's really important to that, that's a really important point to echo. It's something that just inherently, because people are just a little bit lazy, that they 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 don't do until Bitcoin goes up 2x or 3x. But reinforcing that idea, because as Bitcoin's value goes up, it's just it, it's a very intuitive and inherent that people take their security more seriously as they have more to lose. Um, and, and I think it's, um, it's important also while we're building a non-custodial platform at Unchain, I think that you know, we build our platform for a certain target segment of the market that we think is the largest, but others build custodial you know, platforms and it is oftentimes easier to deliver a managed financial service in a custodial environment. But I think you know, I look at myself, you know, at, coming in after Mount Gox, but understanding exactly what happened and, and knowing that, you know, I basically, I was somebody that stared at Bitcoin for two years before I really got involved until it started to click. But once it started to click, it was this idea that there were only 21 million Bitcoin. And if you make a mistake, it's final. And if you understand the asymmetry and the inherent value in that, you want to be in control of your own destiny. Um, and, and that, you know, when, when I think about myself as an individual, I immediately went to securing my own keys. I mean, like bought first Bitcoin on Coinbase, but then quickly moved off because I had a friend that was there to teach me about private key ownership. But then once you go to that point of holding your own private keys, you don't go back. And I think that there is a reality that the longer that people spend time in Bitcoin, there's a very high correlation between time in Bitcoin and holding your own private keys. And people can look at it from the outside looking in and say, ah, oh, it's just a bunch of anarcho-capitalists. They're just ideologues about what, you know, the sovereign individual, but it's really about security. That, you know, there's something that's scary about the permanence of private keys, but there's also something inherently easier about securing something that's physical than securing a password 
that's connecting to a remote server that if it is hacked results in you know a, a critical failure and a ruin event if that makes sense yeah, I mean, I, I, what I think most people don't realize is that our world is a custodial world. Pretty much everything we interact with on a day to day basis is a custodial is, is, is custodial relationship where you're trusting a, a third party and you have this trusted third party that can either make a mistake or they can actually be malicious. Um, with Bitcoin, you actually you have the option to opt out of that third party relationship um, and you're able to do it relatively easily. Now, you mentioned something there about custodial services being easier to set up. And that's absolutely true. It's almost like a cheat code, um, a shortcut, if you will. It's harder to do uh, you know, non-custodial offerings in the Bitcoin space than offer a custodial product. We see that you know, not just um, in financial services, but you see that with stuff like Lightning wallets. Like it's way easier to set up a custodial Lightning wallet um, than it is to do like a proper self-sovereign Lightning wallet. And, and some, some teams have chosen to go that short path. Um, one thing that's key here is since Mt. Gox happened, um, taking this, the, 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 the self-custody path has become infinitely easier than it was before. And your company is one element of that. I mean, your company is literally designed in a way, Unchained Capital is literally designed in a way that you can't have a Mt. Gox type of situation because you are not holding um, the, the full quorum of keys. It's a multi-sig collaborative custody setup. Um, so I kind of want to unpack that a little bit because one of the things we see right now is we see the, these major institutions coming in. Um, they're not holding their own keys for the most part. They're usually using regulated custodians. Um, and a, one of the main arguments that we see from them and we also see from maybe financially savvy boomers, uh, you know, in, individuals as well, is that they prefer to have this custodial relationship because they're used to having their hand held and, you know, properly audited and all these different things that they see in the traditional custodial finance world. Uh, and that makes them feel comfortable. Looks like we, uh, we, we dropped Matt there for a second, but uh, I'll, I'll just pick up where, where Matt was going there. I think that you know, there, there is a reality in the world of, you know, kind of when people come into the Bitcoin space, uh, the working with a institution that looks very similar to a legacy banking institution is a lot more comfortable. There's, there's a reality that if you're facilitating self-custody of your Bitcoin, that you don't have the counterparty risk of a large financial institution. But what that means is if you screw it up, you're done. There's, there's no one to reset your password. And that when people come into Bitcoin for the first time and are new to it, that that permanence of private keys and the foreignness to how they're, you know, they're used to controlling their money uh, is frightening to them. And, it, but one of the things that we, we talk about at Unchained a lot is there's really his, historically before companies like Unchained and Casa, there's kind of two, two ends of the spectrum. There's self-custody and you're on your own. And, and I think the most technically savvy users um, do that and are comfortable doing that and will continue to do that. And it's, and it's perfectly reasonable. And we, we develop multi-sig tools to allow that too, to, to lower the bar for people that don't want to work with the company. But in most instances, it's individuals and they're generally holding a single key rather than using multi-sig. Or there's another end of the spectrum, which is something like a Coinbase that, or, or a Gemini that maps very similarly to, to the legacy banking. Um, what we provide, and I think what we've found in, in providing, you know, what we refer to as collaborative custody, it actually allows people to more easily go to private key ownership, and in, in many cases to go direct to private key ownership, because of a combination of three things. They eliminate single points of failures and keys. They have a technology partner, someone like Unchained, to help explain to them how keys work. We, we walk our clients through setting up their keys, but then also eliminating um, you know, not just our clients being a single point of failure, we eliminate keys a single point of failure, we hold a backup key. So if they ever lose a key or multiple keys or multiple keys in a backup, they can still move their funds because we're there. But then we also eliminate our website as a single point of failure because 
we have an open source tool. And I think when people look at this equation, they, they again, they focus in on the permits of private keys, but what our uh, co-founder Drew Bonsell, um, you know, one of the things that, that, that really connected with me when I was you know, in early discussions with, with Unchained was this idea that people get comfortable um, in the legacy world or, or, or with the Bitcoin custodial the map, that maps to the legacy world because they don't have to, they basically have to take on less responsibility. They don't have to manage private keys. But then ultimately what they're in the position of having to do is secure something that's inherently harder to secure, which is a password authentication. Um, and, and you basically have a security model, like the way I would ultimately describe it is you either have a security model that's built on a permission, permission set of security principles. That's the legacy world and that's the Coinbase world. Uh, and, and what a permission set of security principles means is your protection is they make it really hard for you to get your own money such that it's hard for other people to get your money. But they also do make it hard for you to get your money. And then there's the world of Bitcoin that the entire network is based on a permissionless set of security principles. And if you're facilitating self-custody, whether it's sovereign collaborative custody or on your own, holding your own private keys and not working with a third party, your security principles are based on a permissionless set. Um, that you, you have devices that are physical in the world, they're not connected to servers generally in terms of the majority of your wealth. And that thing, even though it's permanent, is inherently easier to secure because physical objects don't just get up and walk away. Uh, and and, 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 and you know, as humans evolve, we've gotten very good at physically securing things. Um, so there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, it's a lot of good insight. Um, I, I think like one just key aspect to point out here is that in, in your collaborative custody model um, and the, the users holding two keys, uh, like Unchained can go completely out of business. You can go completely out of business. Uh, you know, you, your, your whole company could be wiped off the face of the earth and the individual can still recover their funds. Uh, that is never possible in, in any of these traditional finance relationships, these custody relationships. Uh, which is pretty mind blowing when you start to think about it. Um, the other thing is you mentioned uh, your new like white glove onboarding process. And I think that's very interesting um, in terms of trying to make best practices as frictionless as possible. So, so a, a high net worth individual now can come in right through Unchained and they can just, they, you, you'll do everything for them. They, they buy directly to the multisig that they're, they're handholding. Can we talk about that a little bit? Like, do, do you think that's the future? Do, are we going to see in five years, is the main on-ramp still going to be these default custodial products? Or are we going to see more, you know, unchained capitals or bull Bitcoin where they go straight to the user's wallet? Um, you know, Swan is like kind of custodial, but they also have an auto withdrawal option. So it can go straight to the wallet. Is that what we're going to see more of? Or is it always going to be a niche product? No, I, I, I definitely think that those lines are going to blur. Where when I think about Unchain, our goal is to make you know, multi-sig so easy that, that it is the on-ramp, essentially. I think today what we consider ourselves is we're the place where a Bitcoiner ends their journey. We're basically that for somebody that, that, that is okay working with a third party but demands private key ownership and values us for not just the services that we provide on top but our key us being there as a technology partner that you know whether it's a two or three or three or five will evolve over time but that there's no next step beyond collaborative multi-site i think at least as it relates to the majority of someone's wealth and that where we're building towards and and, and the concierge process is is a key you know kind of step in that cog and in our otc desk is basically going from you don't know anything about bitcoin to having a partner that helps you understand which devices you should use. Basically someone that, that, that is there to tell you, you know, you should be using a Trezor or a cold card or a ledger or a combination and being able to explain the trade-offs. Uh, somebody to help you set those keys up so you understand kind of what it is that you're dealing with. I think historically before companies like ourselves and CASA existed, uh, you know, even when Trezors and Ledgers existed, you know, and, and, and cold cards, that, the, the education around private key management was very ad hoc. The way I learned about it was because just one of my friends told me. Now we're institutionalizing that process, right? Where like rather than you just being a good citizen helping your friend, which your time is valuable, you can send somebody to Unchained or CASA and, and, and then we can help kind of educate on that building block, which is keys. We can then graduate to using multi-sig 
And then we can execute transactions for people and deliver them directly with final settlement the same day. So like one of the best case like use cases that I, that, that I love is we had a, a high net worth individual. We overnighted keys on a Thursday, set up a multi-sig vault on a Friday and executed you know, a multi-million dollar trade in the afternoon and had final settlement of that. Now like that, that is the, you know, and it doesn't have to be multi-million. It could be, you know, a thousand dollars or 2000 or 500, but that, but that is the direction that we're going in. And, and, you know, as we make, you know, additional investments is to basically expand our capabilities on concierge our expand our abilities on fulfilling the purchases to more states uh, but then also to, to make those purchases smaller so they're not just OTC and capacity. So I do think, I think the lines will become blurred. I always, I do believe that there will be people that prefer to live in a, you know, custodial world or there might be applications where um, sovereignty is, is not of value to them, where it's not their money that they're managing and they're, they're uncomfortable in that, you know, kind of in that arrangement. I do think that there's always going to be a world, it's going to be a smaller world because again, as a function of knowledge and the distribution of knowledge, which happens over time, uh, people become more and more comfortable with securing their Bitcoin. But then the tools, just like the ones that we're talking about now and investing in, become easier and easier. And and so I, I really do think that kind of there will be a merger of kind of like what the on ramp looks like to what Unchain looks like today. I think both you know kind of in both directions. That, that the model that, that we're working toward is something that really will become the, the clear standard. I mean, the crazy part is it's, it's not only is it better from a security point of view, um, it's probably an easier process for most people to go through that process, to, you know, your white glove process versus like throwing them into the Coinbase slaughterhouse and, and let them try and figure out what it is. Like it's best practices, but easier as well. Yeah, and, and one of those things that, that, that we talked about where it's easily it's easier to deliver a custodial service. And it's it's easier to deliver a custodial service because a client up front has to do less. But that should also be a signal to the client that they're less secure. I'm having to do less. I'm basically having more abstracted away from me. And and I'm doing it mostly because I, I'm not as informed as a more sophisticated user. But when I say more sophisticated, I'm not saying, you know, a computer scientist that's a programmer, just somebody that's taken the time and investment, which again, you can learn in an afternoon, you'll get comfortable over a course of a week, multiple weeks, and then and then over just months and years, you'll just become hardened in that process. Uh, but when we think about our platform, it's, it's like in order for a client to get set up and especially in bull runs where like the price is ripping in your face, like a client wants to buy Bitcoin now, but if you have to send them multiple keys, you know, like it just, it kind of highlights the, 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 the time preference of people. And we work with a lot of great clients that are like, you know what, I'm not in this for, you know, kind of short term gains. Like I want to get set up the right way. People have referred me to you because this is the standard, which I should take my, you know, custody of my Bitcoin seriously. And and I think we're going to see more and more of those people that, that, you know, kind of in that maturation or graduation phase, we're dealing with people that have significant wealth, they're demanding Bitcoin now, and, you know, they've, they, they're experts in creating wealth and protecting wealth, and they'll understand, and, and, and our experience has been that when you have time to get one-on-one -on -one with someone, and that's also one of the values of our concierge service, it's like, it allows us to go from a, a tech app on the, on, on, you know, on our website to actually having a personal relationship with somebody. But when you can actually communicate to them security principles around Bitcoin, it's not that difficult to, to, to use these devices and get set up. It just requires somebody that's willing to invest the time and willing for a process to you know, have devices shipped out to them. And what we're really working on is getting to that point where I want to be in a place where if somebody shows up at my door at Unchained today, I can literally each time fulfill them one day, two day, you know, like get devices to them and have that, that vault built in 24 to 48 hours. In a typical scenario, we can do that today, but in a typical scenario, it takes a week to two weeks. Uh, but, but trying to accelerate that time frame, I think we'll, we'll make this process of, of um, multiplying and expanding the number of Bitcoin holders that have their own keys um, grow faster and faster. Um, bullish on that. I mean, I think people couldn't really, especially if we go back to the Gox days, people couldn't fathom $50,000 Bitcoin, even the most bullish people. I don't think they could have fathomed um, white glove multi-sig uh, service. Uh, I think that's a, it's a massive improvement there. Um, one thing that's interesting is 
there is this divide. We have these super rich people coming in now, you know, these ultra high net worth individuals, billionaires. Um, we have these massive corporations coming in and there's this weird disconnect where like the average pleb tends to do better best practices um, than, than these large institutions. You know, we had MicroStrategy, they just bought a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. Um, meanwhile, I don't, and they're holding that billion dollars in, in, in addition to their previous Bitcoin, they have 90,000 Bitcoin now. They're holding that with a custodian. I'm not gonna say the custodian's name, but it's a big regulated custodian. Um, they're not holding their own keys. Meanwhile, I wouldn't trust $50 on Cash App and Cash App is, is, is a sponsor of my podcast. Um, so I have like connections there and I don't even trust them with $50. And meanwhile, this guy's got billions of dollars uh, with this custodian. Uh, do, do you see anything on your side that points to these guys figuring it out? Because it seems like collaborative custody would be perfect for them. I'm not expecting, I'm not expecting uh, Michael Saylor to keep 90,000 Bitcoin um, in his own self-sovereign, you know, hard wallet set up with air gap computers and, and their own node. Like, I don't expect that. I'm being realistic here, but collaborative custody seems perfect for their use case. Why don't we see more corporations going that way? Yeah, well, I think one, there's, there's a reality that it's just, it, it maps to the individual, right? So there is a reality that securing Bitcoin as an organization presents different challenges than an individual securing Bitcoin with their own keys. Uh, oftentimes because that Bitcoin, it's like, it's your Bitcoin and it's your keys and you can do what you damn well please with it. And you can make those decisions and those trade-offs. So on the one hand, it's, it's more difficult to kind of gain a consensus of people, but I would, I would let, you know, I would, you know, stress the point that Matt, any company that you work for in the future is going to be holding its own keys because you understand. It. Um, and so it starts with the individual. So we have a number of companies that are coming onto our platform and using collaborative custody. They're generally tightly held by principles that understand why they should, why, why, as an individual, they should be holding their own private keys because if they understand that, then they say, yes, you know what? It, this is different and I have to think about some different considerations, but the foundational principle remains the same. And, and I think what happens in the case of the microstrategy, which I don't fault them, is that, and, I, and I've read the, a quote from Michael Saylor where he's like, you know, yeah, I think he used the, the term like, you know, keys are like nitroglycerin. And like, what am I going to ask one of my employees to like, hey, you hold this nitroglycerin and take that home with you for a while? That like, that doesn't map to the way that, you know, Fortune 500 companies have secured their money in the past. Uh, and I also think that there's a reality that while my platform today, I think works great for very large family offices that are tightly held by, you know, a principal and an individual or a super high net worth individual or uh, a small to medium sized business, that there are financial controls that need to exist at the system level that still need to be built into a platform like Unchained before I can credibly go to a Michael Saylor and be like, hey, like I've got the product now that you should move your $90,000 off towards. But I think that that progress starts from first getting him as an individual to using something like collaborative custody rather than him as an individual using, you know, a you know qualified custodian, a third party custodian. But it's really kind of getting over that mapping of, you know, the permanence of private keys, getting comfortable with the redundancy in something like a multi-sig. Um, but but I think that's just a function of time. I think that the end state of this is every company like MicroStrategy will hold their own keys, and they won't rely on large financial institutions and tolerate the counterparty risk of large financial institutions and having the um, the weaker security. Because, right, they're thinking about it as my, if Michael Saylor says, holding keys and asking one of my employees to touch them is nitroglycerin. Like, it's like, well, there's just an employee on, of your financial institution that has that, is, is doing that same thing. And by abstracting it away, you somehow got more comfortable with it. But it's just somebody that owes you less and that you don't know and that you don't trust, right? So I, I think that I think that that will evolve partly by it will be the maturization, you know, kind of maturation of, of platforms like Unchain to allow you know you know again we're already tailored to organizations but you know we're tailored to financial organizations that might have you know ten or fifteen people in them not a financial organization that potentially has fifty 
you know, and so I think that's just a matter of time. I mean, he's being a, he's being a little bit hyperbolic there with the nitroglycerin. Like you, you, you have a setup, you have setups in place, you know, you have processes in place uh, where, where people can do a combination of Shamir's uh, shards and multi-sig. So you can have like user act, user access control, like no other asset ever before. Like you could have a situation where you have, you know, where you need like a quorum of, of like 20 employees or something going along with Michael Saylor also signing it to, to do a transaction or something like that, which is kind of crazy yeah. uh, that that's even possible. So I, I think, um, and, and from listening to his, his Bitcoin for corporations thing, uh, you'd be wrong to think that he isn't aware of these different trade-offs and stuff. Like, I think I wouldn't be surprised and maybe I'm assuming too much, but I think a, a significant portion of his personal Bitcoin stash, he's doing himself in a self-sovereign way. Um, one thing that is weird to me, and maybe it's just because we're kind of early, is like, if you hold this much Bitcoin, like, how do you not just have like a team, you know, team of, 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 of Bitcoiners that are like your, uh, you know, your go team, your go team that's, you know, in charge of making sure your, your billions of dollars is secure and is ready for the future. Um, you know, runs the node for the company, runs multiple nodes, has redundancies, have all these things. Like this is one thing I expect in the future going forward. Um, but it's not even just these corporations. You have, you have things like GBTC, uh, which is like, I, what do they have? Like 700,000 Bitcoin or something, 800,000 Bitcoin. Um, they're led by, by Barry Silbert, who owns Coindesk. He owns like, he has investments in like a shit ton of, of d different companies in the space. He is one of the most, you know, connected people in the space and they store their, their 700,000 Bitcoin at Coinbase in Coinbase custody. Like, how is that? Like, are, do we need like a situation where there's going to be, is there going to be like a Mount Gox for one of these corporations where like one of these regulated institutions like gets raided or, or, or something happens, they make a mistake, they screw up a backup employee, maybe steals a bunch and like flees the country or goes dark or something like, is that what's going to happen? Like, do we, do we not see them move the needle until they learn the lesson the hard way? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think the, you know, the, the Mount Goxes of the world, the Quadrigas, I think there's a reality that, you know, as the space has matured, that, that people associate it more so with immaturity and kind of nascency. And now that like the, the mature players and the sophisticated, the trusted names are getting involved, that if we just do the old things better, that they'll work out better. Um, and I think that in part that, that you, can, you can engineer for that, but only to, to, to such a degree. Um, and what I mean by that is if the incentive mechanisms are inherently weaker or less secure, then over time you're gonna get, you know, again, it might not happen, you know, this year or next year, but as a function of time, one of these large third-party custodians is going to have a security failure. And that that will resurface to say, oh, it can actually happen to, you know, not suggesting that it would happen to Fidelity, but people look at Fidelity and say, what happened to Mt. Gox could never happen to Fidelity. But if you pool, and this is kind of the, the visualization that I try to paint for people is, imagine Coinbase and there's, you know, $10 billion or $50 billion. And imagine that they're using multi -sig. Imagine there's $50 billion and there's five keys. And then think about Unchain. And for each individual, there's two, you know, minimum two keys and multiple backups. It's like there might be you know, a couple billion that are secured by thousands of keys. And the, the people that, whose wealth it is, they're the ones that are accountable. Such that if they make a mistake, they're penalized, but only they are penalized. That kind of align, that aligns interest in, in, in basically pushing accountability out to the edge. Basically, it removes moral hazard. It, it allows every, it causes everybody to be sharper. So it's more a function of if you have tens or if not hundreds of billions of, of dollars of wealth, and at the end of the day, the billions of wealth are secured by, you know, three keys or five keys or potentially one key if they're sharding keys, because I think you you would be remiss to believe that every large person that's holding a lot of Bitcoin is always using multi-sig. Um, that, that that 
that creates those honey, like honey pots are a real thing. You put a lot of wealth there in one place secured by relatively few number of keys that, you know, it's not going to happen to every single one of them, but if it happens, it's a ruin event. Um, and in Bitcoin, it's all about eliminating single points of failure. And I think people seriously underweight also the risk of you go to ask your bank for money and they just say no, right? Like that is, that is a real risk. It's not just deplatforming. It's, it's the risk of censorship, you know, at a company level, at a, at a, at a, a state level. Um, and so I think it's just when, when, what I often tell people about Bitcoin is, you know, if you're getting into Bitcoin and you see that there's this one thing and it's worth 70 or 80% of the market and there's this thousand copycats and there's so much noise out there, but the market always figures out that, it, that, that Bitcoin is the thing, despite snake oil salesmen all over the place. The same thing exists with self-custody. All the Bitcoiners that came before it that are controlling the majority of the Bitcoin, they've all evaluated all of these trade-offs. And over time, they decide to secure their own keys. And it's and like it's like you have to accept that that's the market sending you a very loud signal. And you might not understand it on day one, but you would be remiss not to engage to try to understand what they know and that you might not. Um, excellent points. Uh, I'm glad we, you know, the corporations thing is a very hot topic right now. So I'm glad we dived into that, but dove into that. But honestly, they can go fuck themselves. I don't really care. Like if they lose their money, they can lose their money. I care more about the individuals, the average plebs. So I want to bring this back. Um, I care about the individuals, average- the, the individuals and small businesses. I love like every time I onboard a small business, like I love that. Yeah. Small businesses, hundred percent, you know, small businesses do not use, do, please do not use a regulated custodian. Um, the not your keys, not your coins. You don't have Bitcoin. You have an IOU if, if you're using one of them. Um, to the individual and to the small businesses, I you know I had a very insightful conversation with Craig Raw last night uh, for my my new show Citadel Dispatch. Um, and Craig is the lead maintainer of Sparrow Wallet, which is a multi-sig open source coordinator. Um, and he made an interesting point that I think isn't really hammered home enough. And I'm curious what your thoughts are here. Um, that the single biggest benefit of multi-sig to an individual or a small business is physical security is this idea that you're holding wealth and you don't want to be in a situation where someone could come into your office or come into your home with a gun or or some other kind of weapon um and 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 compel you to give them your bitcoin would you agree i would i would agree that or i would agree that that's a really important trade-off benefit um i would say that the most important thing to me is that my Bitcoin are only moving by a function of me or people that I trust and know. That basically my wealth will be there should I want it to be. Um, I do think that the physical security is an important component of it. Um, But when I say that, I mean, everybody walking or, well, anybody that's on Twitter knows that I own Bitcoin. And if they wanted to come and coerce me to do something and put a gun to my head, like, hey, I'm going to kill your family, you know, go get key one, go get key two, do it, you know, or you're dead. Like that same exact circumstance can play out. Yeah, yes, is it marginally harder? But I like, like I, what I reinforce for people is that we live in a world where, you know, if I was living in Nicaragua, I'd approach my security different than I was living in Austin, Texas. Right, like I could, I could, you know, I'm subject to, you know, and, and people often talk about like the risk of a private key being at your home, and somehow they think that if you have your a phone that connects to your Coinbase account, that you're any more or less secure, right? Because it's like, hey, I break into your house, open up your phone, and send that hundred thousand dollars off your phone, right? Um, so I think, I think to a degree, yes, but it's more, it's more in this line of by having multi-sig and having having your keys be geographically distributed, it protects you for all weapons. I think more about like what if my house burns down, right? And like, that's a low probability event, but I was onboarding a client the other day and I was, I used that exact analogy. He's like, oh no, no, you don't have to tell me that's me. Like I just got finished rebuilding my house because my house burned down. So the, like it's, it's the physical security, it's protection against yourself, it's protection against the unknown. You're essentially creating a web. I think about Bitcoin and multi-seg, whether it's a two of three or a three of five, as you have these physical anchor points that are in the world, that don't move and they're redundant to each other. And once they're in place, 
the wealth that you secured in the Bitcoin network is not going to be lost unless it's a function of you, you know, selling your sats to a billionaire and panic selling too early, basically. Well, to, to be clear here, first of all, Craig is from uh, South Africa, which are the highest, one of the highest crime rates in the world. So it makes sense that this is one of the main things that he's thinking about when he's talking about uh, how, how to self-custody your Bitcoin. Um, I, I think a key thing there is if, you, if, if the standard in this space becomes geographically distributed multi-sig, uh, and set up in a way that it takes a long a, a, a time period, a, a longer time period to spend from that setup. Uh, it discourages these types of attacks because it becomes you have to you have to be a more sophisticated actor to do that attack. If you have to hold someone's family hostage for four or five days uh, while the keys are while while the person's traveling around the world, you know, to to get the different keys and stuff. All of a sudden, you're talking a major crime, right? Like this is this is not just a like a smash and grab. Um, and and when it becomes yeah, a default, but, you see less attacks because they just assume like, oh, if, if that person, it's it's going to be harder for for me to get it, right? Yeah, no, I, I think that's fair. But I also think that there's a there's a there's a you know, violence is is largely a function of like rule of law and like you know the, the society that you live in. That like if somebody's willing to come into your house with a gun. Like that's a, you're doing jail for, for 10 years type of person, right? So it's like, I do agree though, that this type of, if, if everyone lived in a world where they said, you know what, everyone's using multi-sig in geographically distributed locations. So there's, there's not a bunch of keys sitting in homes. So don't, don't be the wise guy. I, I certainly believe that beyond marginally that improves people's security by by reducing that incentive or the the you know ability to go to a single physical location but there's also a reality that if we're talking about this it's one of the primary reasons of self custody that it's a, a an attacker if they're going to make a physical threat on you is is a much higher bar than a hacker that's sitting in you know some random country that's you know sitting there running social engineering attacks on coinbase users um, or on Coinbase employees, you know, or extorting Coinbase employees. Um, so yeah, I, I absolutely think it's important from the security element. I also think that there's kind of, there's just that, you know, I think Michael Flaxman uses the term that I probably, you know, I like the most. It's, it's fault tolerance. So maybe part of fault tolerance is somebody that, you know, would otherwise could come take a monkey wrench to you or walk into your house is less incentivized to do that because they know that you're not a single point of failure. Uh, but that fault tolerance extends beyond there as well. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's like, Pete, yeah, go ahead. I mean, a key aspect here, just in general, is, is regardless, not, this is not just a Bitcoin thing. Attacker, you know, you just have to run faster than the slowest person from the bear, right? Like attackers go for the lowest hanging fruit. Um, and, you know, we can talk about all these different security things. Uh, but meanwhile, the most effective attack is like trying to trick someone into giving up your seed or pressing a phishing link or something like that and just typing it into a computer. So if you if you raise that bar of, of, of your own security, more likely than not, it's not guaranteed, but more likely than not, um, attackers will go for the lower hanging fruit that they can, you know, just trick people in, into doing, right? And they can do it remotely. Yeah, 100%. And I, um, and I think that the way I envision people having their Bitcoin security stack is... Kind of think about four different layers lightning a, a single key mobile wallet a single key hardware wallet and then multi-sig and so i think about because there's, there's a reality that if you are in a two of three multi-sig with all cold sort keys or a three of five with one of them being mobile and you have to go to multiple physical locations like you are making it harder for you to get access to your money such that it's hard for others to get access to your money basically that you know you're the only one that has permissions to those those points but you're basically creating redundancy to, to eliminate those single points of failure. But that means, hey, if you need to get up and go, you know, say there's a, you know, say there's a, you know, a, a wildfire in California and you got to go, you might not be able to swing by the bank to get your second key. Um, and, and so I think about it as like people are going to have their majority of their wealth sitting in collaborative multi-sig or a sovereign multi-sig. Um, where they hold all the keys and don't work with a third party. And then they're gonna have, you know, that may be like 95% of their wealth, or like 96 or 97%. And then they're gonna have another one or two that's on a single cold stored key that, you know, is more readily available. And then they're gonna have, you know, 
walking around money on their, you know, mobile wallet, and then they're going to have some money, you know, in a lightning channel. That, that it's like each one of those applications are probably going to be used by every individual, and they're going to be allocated based on the, you know, how readily and how quickly they need to, to access money. Because in that scenario where, you know, if there's a wildfire in California and you've got, you know, one key at, at your place, but the other key's in a safe deposit box, you're getting out of town, you're going to grab your Bitcoin that's sitting just on, you know, a single key and be like, all right, I've got, you know, money that if I, if I need it in the next few days, I have it. Um, so there's, there's trade-offs on either side, but, uh, but security is definitely one of them. I think in general, though, it's more, you know, tolerating, you know, faults in all circumstances. Yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, people need to go and think through their threat model, think through what they're planning for um, and act accordingly. And, and one of the nice things about your service is that they have someone there that they can talk to if they want to work through that. Um, so this has been a great discussion, but before we wrap it up, I mean, I, I figure we should go, go to everyone's favorite topic, which is number go up. Um, I, you have one of the, Unchained has a fantastic blog. You have one of the, the best blogs in Bitcoin. Um, you have a series on that blog called Gradually Then Suddenly. Um, Parker, are, are we in the suddenly phase or are we still in the gradually phase? I, I would personally say we're still in the gradually phase. You know, so, so long as, you know, it's like in, in one context, it is very sudden. Like, you know, six months ago, Bitcoin was at 10K and, and now we're, we're at 50. But, but, you know, we have these, you know, fits and starts. So I think, I, I think that we were, you know, the suddenly phase, I feel like was like the 10 to 20 where it's like, hey, we're on now. But now it's kind of, you know, it's, it's the move to 40 and the pullback to 30. And now it's like the move to 58 and the pullback to 50. It does, it does feel very sudden. Um, but I also think that this is, what we're going to look back on in like six months that this was the controlled part of the move uh, that that there's you know like it will probably be in some like controlled you know part of reality into like 100k and then shit's really going to flip out you know and people are going to you know get fear inducing panic and just start hitting the pit. so um i think either way you know we're, we're, we're somewhere between those two points so uh, i think we should all be happy yeah i mean i don't think people People, people still aren't really um, appreciating the gravity of, of what comes next. I mean, I, I think we're wholeheartedly still in the gradual phase. Uh, people think Caps Odell is, 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 is Matt in, is myself in, uh, in the suddenly phase. The suddenly phase, I'm just going to be fucking speechless. Like, I'm just going to, I'm going to have nothing to say. I'm, I'm all caps right now because I want people to get in before we hit the sudden phase. The, the, the Matt suddenly phase is like, we're never going to hear from you again. You know, like, <laughs> it's like suddenly you're going to be gone. You're going to be like, hey, that was it, guys. Like, he's gone. Like, that that must be it. So, I you know, I do think that um, we're, we're still in the phase where people are, um, not everyone, but but that, that people are taking the time and are having the opportunity to evaluate Bitcoin from a fundamental perspective. Again, not everyone, people are just FOMO buying, people are you know, trading it because they want to speculate and it's just you know, stocks and you know, kind of the, there, there are, will always be those, those less informed people. But I consider it still this gradual part because the, the people that are coming in, the corporations that are spending the time to tune in to Michael Saylor and Ross Stevens interview and, and that entire program, those are people that are looking at this phenomena and saying what's happening here and the fact that they have the time to determine for themselves that this is something that they either want or don't signals to me that we're still in the gradual phase because there will be a point in time where bitcoin is the only option and if you didn't voluntarily choose you know today you know yesterday or in the days to come or weeks or potentially even a few years that, it, that, that you're not going to have an option anymore, where it's just going to be like, you don't have a choice. You're, you're going to be very glad that Bitcoin does exist because if it didn't, you wouldn't have a, another option. And I think I, I kind of characterize that as more of that, that you know, true sudden phase. I think on the individual level, it's happening every day. People's understanding of Bitcoin goes from gradually to like it clicking and it making sense and that light bulb going on. So it's kind of like on the individual level, I have, just, I, have, I have this picture of this sea of people where it's just like light bulbs going on and there's more and more of those people every single day. And the, for, the, for the market-wide segment, 
it's when we get to a critical mass of a number of those people where we no longer need the old system. Yeah, I mean, I, I think most people just, they think Bitcoin's a scam or can't work. And then all of a sudden they have FOMO and it goes the opposite direction. They have FOMO and that FOMO just never turns off, right? Right, yeah. And, 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 and for those people that still have the ability to evaluate whether it is or isn't a scam, that signals that we're still in the gradually phase of this whole thing. Because, because like I, at the point where everyone has to like just hit eject and be like, shit, like I can't think whether or not it's real or not. I just have to be in. That's when you know that, that we've, we've hit suddenly. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't really know. I, I, I was, I kind of wanted. There's no real concrete when we hit sudden, right? Like, you, there's, there's not going to be a tell. I mean, one thing is like, like Square announced yesterday that they bought like 170 million dollars worth of Bitcoin, and everyone was just like, "That's it. Like, you only have five percent of your reserves in Bitcoin." Um, yeah. Like, is that that's the gradual phase, right? I mean, what, what, what's, I, I don't even know. I, I, I don't know what suddenly is going to look like. I don't think we can really fathom it. Yeah, I think that it. I mean, it's. Um, I, th I think that there will be, in, you know, in my view, we're going to get to a point in time where there's a critical mass of Bitcoin holders. And I don't know what percentage of that is. That, that is. It's 20%, 30%, somewhere around there, where you reach a critical mass where the prevalence of people accepting Bitcoin at storefronts starts to go up significantly. Uh, and, and it becomes like the true crowded theater heading for the exits. Like I, I believe at that point in time on a market-wide basis will happen in a, in a more six, uh, significant way or existential way than like the 2017, you know, like basically the forever cycle. There will be a forever cycle, you know, I, I believe. Like it won't just be like, you know, we didn't, we, we had to look back and note, you know, you know, when did that happen? Like there will be a forever cycle where everyone's like, oh, we're not going back. Everyone's just, you know, has to shift to Bitcoin if they're not already on it. But let's just, so we have a little bit more time. Let's just talk about that for a second. Do you think that this is, this time is different or are we going to have like a, an 80% correction at the end of this cycle? I'll go on the record and say, I think that there's going to be another correction. And my theory on it, my theory on it is, and again, I was, uh, I started buying Bitcoin for like 2016. So I was early. I didn't have to like, I didn't have to withstand the pain of the full bear cycle last time. I was like, I, I like started buying at the right time. But what I believe happens is that it's the altcoiners that cause the parabolic move um, because the altcoiners are selling their Bitcoin to billionaires right now. And, you know, cause like you and I aren't selling our Bitcoin to Michael Saylor or Ross Stevens or Square but it's people that are now getting flush with dollars and they've just sold their Bitcoin. And there's gonna come a point in time when they figure out that those dollars are buying less Bitcoin and they're gonna to have to rotate back in and they're traders. So they're the ones that are gonna cause the panic. Like the people that are like, you know, fundamentalist Bitcoiners, they're buying Bitcoin all along. If it drops, they might buy a little bit more, but they're not getting out ahead of their skis, at least, you know, in the overwhelming majority. And so I think it's this, it's like you have to picture like what's happening right now. Like who are the people that are selling their Bitcoin to these billionaires and to these mega corporations? It's the same. It's the traders. It's traders. And as soon as it becomes clear that they've made the wrong trade, they're going to rotate those dollars back into Bitcoin and crush their altcoins. And that's going to send this. It's like it's going to cause a pair. I think it will cause a parabolic move where it's just essentially Bitcoin's rise outpaces its ability to form liquidity. And then once you get on the other side of that curve and like the, the confidence is just broken for a moment, then you just have to go through that logical, like, oh, are we hitting the bottom? Are we hitting the bottom? And then eventually it will stabilize, you know, five, six, you know, four, five, six X higher than the you know prior cycles all time high and start to reform a wave. I think it's just, I think it's unavoidable at this point that like that, that it probably happens in like 12 months from now that we'll see some like, you know, because right now, again, when Bitcoin moves to 58, it like, like it does price discovery. People like sell it off. And then like we, we debate, you know, whether or not, you know, today at least it's like 48, 49. Um, but then once it gets to hundred, people are going to panic. And those altcoiners that were selling their Bitcoin to Michael Saylor, are going to use all those dollars to buy a fraction of the Bitcoin back. And they're going to send it to a level that's like, you know, crazy high 250, 300 K 
and that, 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 that rapid move will just outpace the ability for corporations to plug in or you know, billionaires to plug in to be able to provide actual dollar liquidity to support, say, like a $350,000 price of Bitcoin. I mean, I think, you know, Bitcoin is, I mean, you made a lot of good points. There. I pretty much agree with everything you said. Uh, your top end is is a little bit too bearish for me. Um, I think for a, a stacker, it doesn't really matter. You just keep keep accumulating Bitcoin, you know, over time. Um, I think in general, what people don't realize is Bitcoin is the, the closest thing to a free market we've ever had, um, especially in modern humanity. Um, and as such, it is very susceptible to human emotion and you're going to have you're going to have panic FOMO on the way up and you're going to have panic dumping on the way down. And that's probably going to always happen. I think what happens is, is as liquidity increases, then the volatility should edge out. So the upward moves will be slow, the less severe and the downward moves will be less severe in general purchasing power will net up long-term. Would you agree? Yeah, I, I would generally agree. I do think though, I do think that in potentially in the next time, like either the next time or the time after that, probably, I think we have this cycle and then we have one, maybe two more that there, there does become a time where like, you know, Bitcoin just replaces fiat and we don't have that, you know, kind of like that, that becomes the forever event where like everyone with the value of fiat just, you know, becomes the, the Venezuelan Boulevard. I could see that happening, you know, two happenings from now type, type scenario. But I mean, that's not really any different than what we currently, I mean, when we currently see usually every cycle, it leaves a, a magnitude of prices in the past, right? It's it, like, you know, uh, it, it, it does, but, but, but during that period, fiat has like, at least in the developed world, dollars, euros, yens, they have, they have maintained their relative purchasing power in real goods. Um, and I think in that forever event, that no longer will be the case. Yeah, fair every, enough. I mean, I would that, that everyone's like market sell the fiat. I I would just warn people that uh, this cycle top will probably be around when the consensus is that it's the super cycle forever cycle, uh, because that's what happened. I, it, that's what happened to me last time. I, last time <laughs> I was like I had complete composure up until 10k, and then once we passed 10k and started moving to 20k, I was like hyper Bitcoinization is upon us. It happened quicker than we thought. And this is like the new paradigm. And then of course, that was like 16 days of craziness. And then we, that was the blow off top. Yeah, I agree. We're headed to the same thing. So I don't know what level that is, but agree with you from a psycho psychology perspective. Um, anyway, Parker, this was a great fucking conversation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, big thank you for, for joining us. Uh, big thank you to all the listeners who joined us. A big thank you to Bitcoin Magazine for hosting us. Uh, I look forward to seeing you at the conference. Uh, do you have any final thoughts for the listeners? Get to Miami, June 4th, 5th, Let's... Bitcoin 2021. I think Big Block Boom might be sold out, but if it isn't, also check that out because I'll be at both and I'll be fine. What, what, people don't realize, what people don't realize about Big Block Boom 2020 is that was the real 100K party. Uh, yeah. That was a real 100K party. Yeah. How, how great was that? I mean, being there with Bitcoiners in the middle of this, this pandemic uh, in person, Bitcoin was trading at like $10,000 and it was only like the true believers, like all the true believers were there. Like, I, yeah. I don't think it's that experience. Uh, yeah, but, we're going to we're gonna, we're gonna get, we're gonna get the band. Completely different. We're going to get the band back together in Miami. Fuck yes. Looking forward to it. Thank you, Parker. Thank you, Bitcoin Magazine. Thanks to all the listeners. I believe this will be catastrophic for Bitcoin, both as a currency and as a fledgling industry. If this is a hoax, it is one that I am fully blindsided by. I fear, however, that it is not. With these words, blogger Ryan 2-Bit Idiot Selkis sent shockwaves through the global Bitcoin market. The documents he had received, which had been circulating among concerned investors for some days, would soon prove authentic sending the price into freefall. It was worse than any of Mt. Gox's many detractors could have feared. As much as 750,000 Bitcoins, worth more than $300 million, were missing from the world's largest exchange. 
what had begun at the start of February with an unexplained suspension of withdrawals would end swiftly with the Japan-based exchange's sudden filing for bankruptcy. Just weeks after Bitcoin had exploded into the public consciousness, setting new highs above $1,000 for the first time, the exchange responsible for more than 80% of global trade had been hacked and taken offline, its future uncertain. For critics, the event was proof Bitcoin's promise of a digital money system free from the woes of traditional banking was a pipe dream. Regulators would grow alarmed at what they saw as a system lacking consumer protections, holding hearings around the globe. Wells Fargo, the first bank to consider Bitcoin services, would shut down a pioneering internal program. Forever etched in the minds of many would be the headlines that heralded the end of Satoshi Nakamoto's experiment and images of a stoic Mark Karpelis, the cherubic 29-year-old CEO whose homespun approach to operations turned the company into a honeypot for hackers. Indeed, for the some 120,000 customers who lost money in the collapse, the pain was real and lasting. Some were shut out from hundreds or thousands of Bitcoins, life-changing wealth that would vanish as swiftly as it came. Others would embark on a still ongoing fight to retrieve reparations, only to face hurdles and setbacks time and again. But out of the ashes of its biggest test, Bitcoin would emerge stronger. Early users who had turned to the exchange, the first to bring something like traditional order book execution to the sector, became its latest wave of emboldened entrepreneurs. Gemini's Tyler and Cameron Winklevoss, Shapeshift's Eric Voorhees, and Kraken's Jesse Powell would all start new exchanges, building back a global trading network stronger and more resilient than that which came before. Still more innovators would turn the page on old industry models altogether, building products and services that would enable users to take control of their digital wealth in ways never before imagined or possible in any financial system. Seven years later, the incident remains a reminder of the perils of centralized systems and provides evidence for just how far the technology and its services have advanced since its earliest days. On February 24th, Bitcoin Magazine remembers the fall of Mt. Gox. many places to buy Bitcoin. They collect your personal information and jeopardize your privacy. KYC is the illicit activity. BISC is open source. It does not collect user data. You keep your private keys, create or take offers to trade peer-to-peer, -peer, and keep your Bitcoin private and secure. Welcome to the Bitcoin Twitch channel, hosted by Bitcoin Magazine. I'm Don, one of the co-hosts of The Marble Show. Join myself, Flip, and Tommy for exciting marble racing simulations and talk about the latest news in Bitcoin. We also run giveaways and promotions that dole out sweet, sweet Satoshis. Follow and subscribe to the Bitcoin Twitch channel, have fun playing games with other Bitcoiners, and maybe you'll find yourself with a few more Satoshis in your pocket.
What is up, Bitcoiners? For the next 15 minutes, I am going to be teaching you guys how to go from zero to fully self-sovereign Bitcoin usage with multi-sig. You guys, this is one of the best setups that we've had to date. It combines a good old-fashioned pruned Bitcoin core node and an awesome, awesome open source project that has just come out, Spectre Wallet. So Spectre Desktop is built on top of Bitcoin Core. You do not need Electrum. You do not need anything other than downloading a Bitcoin Core node and then using Spectre to interface directly with that node. So in this video, I am going to download Bitcoin Core. I'm going to download Spectre. I am going to set up a two of three multi-sig with three awesome hardware wallets. The first is industry-leading security with the cold card Mark III. The second is the OG Bitcoin hardware wallet, the Trezor. And lastly is the cutting edge Kobo Vault, which is used and is industry leading in terms of its PSBT signing through QR code. There are trade-offs with both all three of these wallets, especially with the Kobo and the Trezor. But one of the keys to using multi-sig, especially with your own node, is that you don't actually have to trust any one of these manufacturers because your wallet is going to be effectively created and generated by all three and you need at least two in order to sign. So um, you are downloading a full node on your laptop, on your MacBook, since that's what a lot of people use. It's only going to take up a few gigabytes of memory since it's a pure pruned node and then we are going to use Spectre which is built right on top of Bitcoin Core with these three commodity hardware wallets um, in order to hodl our Bitcoins without having to trust anyone. This is better than Coinbase. This is better than Ledger Live. This is better than almost anything else out there and again you can use a laptop you already have and about $200 worth of Bitcoin hardware wallets and you are absolutely good to go. So let's just start walking through the first steps. Step one is you need to download a Bitcoin Core node. So uh, you can go to Bitcoin.org and go and download a Core node for the operating system of your preference. I'm going to be downloading a Mac node. Next is you need to go to Spectre.Solutions and download the open source Spectre desktop wallet. So this is a preview of what it's going to look like. And it's going to show you how to use it for multi-sig. They support almost every single hardware wallet out there. Uh, and then it will lead you to their GitHub page where you can download the software. Remember, guys, when you download this software, you need to be checking their PGP keys. I really like this guide on how to set up Bitcoin Core from Keep It Simple BTC. So the website is keepitsimplebitcoin.com. Kiss is freaking awesome. He is a friend of Bitcoin Magazine, and he puts out absolutely incredible content for Bitcoiners that is focused on teaching you how to use this stuff right. So this guide in particular is about how to use Bitcoin Core properly so you can watch his complete video. He also timestamps the most important things. And at the first minute, he shows you how to verify your PGP key for both. You can use it for Core as well as Spectre. Let's jump into what this software actually looks like and feels like. Okay guys, so once you have downloaded Bitcoin Core, the wallet is a really simple interface. Uh, there's not, you don't actually have to even do anything with it, but that's what Bitcoin Core looks like. Uh, it takes about, I don't know, four, three to four days to download Bitcoin Core um, and then again, verify it completely without trusting anyone else. And then from there, uh, it will become a prune node and just run uh, and keep up with the blockchain every single time you open it up. It is pretty easy. It's pretty easy for uh, your node, your laptop to catch back up with the chain head once it's been completely fully downloaded. And you can just close this. You don't need it anymore. Next is Spectre. So this is Spectre Desktop. Um, they have really created an awesome onboarding process to get you going. If you download a Bitcoin Core directly to your uh, your laptop and there are no issues, it's configured correctly. You will Spectre should just automatically recognize it. But if it doesn't, you can click over here and they have a step by step process. 
as you can see here, uh, I had it auto detect off so I can just show you guys. I'm gonna test it. So as you can see, auto detect worked. I have uh, Bitcoin, this connected to Bitcoin Core and I can start adding wallets and devices to Spectre. Um, really quickly, if you are having any issues with Spectre recognizing Bitcoin Core on your laptop, most likely it is because you need to uh, put different settings in your configuration file. So if you look down in the show notes, uh, there should be a way uh, for you to uh, grab and get into your Bitcoin application support file and find the configuration file. And then from there, I also have instructions on how to use Rodolfo Novak, the creator of the cold card, he maintains best practices for a Bitcoin full node configuration file. Uh, so there will be a GitHub link in the show notes to take you guys there. Grab his file from GitHub, replace your configuration file with Rodolfo's configuration file. And then voila, you will notice that Spectre immediately finds your, your, your Bitcoin full node on your laptop. All right, guys. So Step number one is I need to put all of my hard all of my hardware wallets onto here. So first and foremost is Cold Card. This is the best hardware wallet out there, um, and it is one of the main wallets that I'm using for all of my cold storage. So uh, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to hit Add Device. It's going to have a wide menu of different devices that they support. They pretty much support every single hardware wallet. I'm going to go click on Cold Card, and then if you plug in your cold card, you're going to hit on get via USB. If you're using your SD card, you're going to click on use the SD card. So I'm going to click in on that. I have the file already on my laptop and boom. There we go. We have my multi-sig signatures and wallet uploaded. And then I'm going to click on add device. And now I want to add another device. Next is going to be the Kobo Vault. So the Kobo Vault is really cool. I'm gonna name it really quick. So the Kobo Vault is really cool because it uses QR codes in order to maintain its air-gapped signing. So I don't have to plug anything into this Kobo Vault. I'm actually just going to use my webcam in order to scan the QR code to give the proper information over to Spectre Wallet. So next step is I pull up my QR code. I have to hit scan QR code and boom. There you go. There is my multi-sig signature for Kobo. Gonna hit add device. Now I need to add one more signature for my three uh, or my two of three multi-sig. Last is gonna be the good old-fashioned Trezor. I'm gonna plug this one in through USB so it's not gonna be with um, air gapped like the cold card and the Kobo. But if you think of it, this can be your third signature. This can be your backup signature. Plugging the Trezor in. And one of the best things about using Trezor on Spectre is that when you use Trezor on Spectre, you don't actually have to rely on Trezor Bridge, Trezor's website, in order to sign into your Trezor. So a lot of other folks that use Trezor do actually link back to Trezor's centralized website, which is just, it's just like not Bitcoin. It's not a Bitcoin way to use hardware. It's to use someone's server every time you want to log into that hardware. That doesn't really matter, though. Spectre fixes this. Spectre does not use any sort of link up to Trezor's bridge. As you can see, the pin pad pops up right here. So I'm gonna plug in my pin. Boom, all of the wallets have been uploaded. Add device. And I am gonna create my multi-sig wallet. So I have my Kobo vault, my cold card, and my Trezor. I need to select all three wallets, and now I'm gonna hit continue. So I'm choosing all the parameters. So I'm choosing SegWit. I'm choosing two out of three. Here are my three signers. And I am going to go over here and I'm going to name this. I'm going to call this Bitcoin Magazine Test. Create wallet. Okay, so my wallet is created. Now this is extremely important. This is my backup PDF. This is the instructions in an emergency where I lose one of these devices and I lose this a laptop that has all the map effectively to my Bitcoin balance, 
this PDF is the backup. So you want to put this in a safe place. You want to encrypt this uh, and you want to be really, really safe with this. So I'm going to hit continue. Next is you need to get the cold card and the Kobo vault synced up. So that way they know the rest of the multi-sig wallet information. So because the Trezor is already plugged in, it has the information. So it knows what the multi-sig is. But we need to show the Kobo vault and we need to transfer the information over to the cold card. So both of these devices know about the signing information that were committed by the other devices in the quorum. So first I'm going to hit show QR code and then on my Kobo vault I'm going to hit import multi-sig wallet and I'm going to use my device to scan okay I'm confirming the details and I hit confirm so now the full multi-sig wallet is on this device as in this device knows exactly how to retrieve the wallet next is the cold card so the cold card takes a couple more steps because it doesn't have the QR code scanning that still uses PSBT. So what I'm going to do is cold card uses uh, the micro USB. So I'm going to plug in the micro USB to my computer and transfer it all over. So I'm going to save the cold card file, take that file and put it into my SD card, eject the SD card and put it into my cold card. So I want to go to my cold card after I put in the SD card and I go to multi-sigs and then I hit import from SD card. It's the first option. It's going to show me the name of the wallet. It shows me the two of three, the, and all the information about my cosigners. I'm going to click accept and now it is saved onto this wallet. Boom, there's a cold, there is a, all the information for that multi-sig is now on this device. The last step here is to verify that these addresses are in fact being generated by the wallet that you created. The way to do that is you need to hit display addresses on device. So. We have this address here and I'm going to hit display address on device. It needs to detect a device. So I'm going to plug the treasure back in. All right. So now the treasure is showing me the exact address that is displayed on the screen. That's it guys. I just confirmed this multi-sig address and on the treasure, I can hit show me the QR code and scan directly from the treasure if I want to maximize uh, the the security of the transaction here hit continue and boom so you guys we downloaded bitcoin core we connected it to spectre wallet we connected spectre wallet to three everyday hardware wallets and we created a two of three multi-sig wallet for us to use in a completely self-sovereign way to hodl our bitcoin and use bitcoin and then we verified that all of the address information that we would be seeing and sending our bitcoins to on Bit on spectre wallet is in fact also verified on our three individual hardware wallets all right guys i hope this was helpful this is ck from bitcoin magazine i hope you learned a lot and that you are enjoying the Bitcoin price. Make sure to smash that like button and make sure to share this with your friends and family. Stack sats and stay humble, y'all. Peace. Places to buy Bitcoin. 
They collect your personal information and jeopardize your privacy. KYC is the illicit activity. BISC is open source. It does not collect user data. You keep your private keys, create or take offers to trade peer-to-peer, -peer, and keep your Bitcoin private and secure. Welcome to the Bitcoin Twitch channel, hosted by Bitcoin Magazine. I'm Don, one of the co-hosts of The Marble Show. Join myself, Flip, and Tommy for exciting marble racing simulations and talk about the latest news in Bitcoin. We also run giveaways and promotions that dole out sweet, sweet Satoshis. Follow and subscribe to the Bitcoin Twitch channel, have fun playing games with other Bitcoiners, and maybe you'll find yourself with a few more Satoshis in your pocket. Welcome back. to our yeah. final panel of <laughs> Over each other. hit us, Pete. Let's go. We're back here in the studio, uh, Legacy of Mount Gox, streaming live from Nashville here at, at Bitcoin Magazine. Uh, my co-host Matt doing a double intro there. You give people two intros at once, they get twice the intro. That's the lesson. The more, the better. So how's everybody doing today? We got the last talk in our live stream here about Bitcoin exchange history, self-sovereignty, and more. Why doesn't everybody go around the horn? We introduce ourselves. <laughs> Who's first? Yeah, who wants to go first? I, I got go it. Go, Evan. Hey, y'all. I'm Evan Kalutis. Um, I published the Zeus app. And, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of lightning stuff. Over to you, Rodolfo. Hey, NVK from CoinKite. I make Code Card, Open Dime, the Block Clock, and a bunch of other stuff. Sweet. Yeah, I'll go. Pete Rizzo, uh, editor here at Bitcoin Magazine and editor at large at Kraken, cryptocurrency exchange, hosting this also. Matt O'Dell here. Fucking love Bitcoin. You may have seen my caps on Twitter. Um, this is a very important stream, and I'm looking forward to this conversation to end up end the day um, because both NVK and Evan are hands-on in terms of trying to make it easier to use um, Bitcoin in a self-sovereign, self-custody fashion. Um, and it's absolutely imperative that not only do we educate the newcomers coming into the space, why custodian risk is such a big deal, but also provide them tools that make it easy for them to, to mitigate that risk. Should I take the lead here? This yeah, moment, Matt, you're going to have to. That was a moment of silence for the Mount Gox victims. I think. That's right. Oh, yeah, it's, it's just sad, you know, thinking Can about I... all that money lost. All right. If you guys go on uh, Bitcoin treasuries, let me tell you right now how much money they have 
in their in their uh, for this position, 141,000 Bitcoin. It's more that's, than half percent of the 21 supply. It's the Mt. Gox uh, KK, the decisions that trust that they created to, to dispose of almost 7 billion US dollars at the current rate. And that's what's still in there, not what was taken by the hacker, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's crazy. It's just the fact that, you know, that's still not been distributed out, like, as they're maneuvering through all these legal things. Like, I mean, the lawyers are making the money, right? Yeah. And uh, I was listening to the stream earlier, like that, those funds might not even, they might end up in Carpilas's hands for a while. And, and, you know, he he might have to choose himself to distribute it out to get it. Hey, do you know how much cat food costs? You know, cat food's in latte, man. It's, uh, (laughs) it's pricey. Man, it's it's so Pete's lost. The, I, I'm not sure, but anyway, the the crazy thing to me about Gox um, is well, one of the crazy things about about that there's a trustee that's in charge of this like bankruptcy hearing, and in the last cycle he was was heralded as he kind of called he he might have caused you know the the dump in the beginning, but he kind of called the top. He sold it. I, he sold a, a large portion of it, um, you know, in like this 15 to 18 K range. Um, but meanwhile, the process has taken so fucking long that now it looks like he sold the bottom, you know, he sold the top of the last cycle, but, but, but we're so far from that now it's fucking crazy. Yeah. I mean, if I, if I remember right, the rules of that trust, is like, I think the disposition is going to happen in fiat. Not in BTC. Right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So like people can be paid back potentially uh, what the dollar uh, cost of like or value of the Bitcoins were at the time, but then the trust can still have all this extra money. So can we get Pete so- better? Yeah. Can we get Pete back here so that he can tell the story of collab and like how, uh, you know, it's believed on how the coins were taken because somebody built a backdoor into uh, 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 into Gox. Yeah, I can, yeah it, I can do a brief summary. For, yeah, for, do it. I think people are, don't know anymore. Yeah, so for those who are just joining, uh, you know, Mt. Gox didn't just lose 750,000 Bitcoin. Uh, the proprietors of Mt. Gox uh, also didn't know that. <laughs> so what happened was that, uh, you know, the Mt. Gox exchange was actually hacked farther back. It was founded in 2010. Uh, hacked, it seems, at some point between uh, 2011 and 2012, unbeknownst to the operators uh, who continued running the exchange. And from the available information that we know, uh, essentially what was occurring was uh, they ran the exchange. They had cold wallets, you know, kept offline for storage and, and hot wallets, right, that connected to the customer accounts. And, and that was the logic of, of how to set up the exchange. Uh, and I think still the way, you know, a lot of exchanges set things up today. Uh, But essentially, you know, they would assume that when money was leaving the hot wallet, it was going to customers. Uh, But what actually was happening (laughs) was somebody was siphoning uh, that money out of the exchange. Uh, So (laughs) they thought they were refilling the wallet uh, because they were doing great business. It turns out they were going to somebody else. Uh, And in uh, early 2014, late 2013, at some point, uh, what they did is they audited the exchange and they realized uh, the extent of their of their uh, really massive loss, uh, right? I, it's it's uh, up for debate, I guess, at this point, how much they knew and when. Uh, the other story I think that we haven't really talked about on this uh, live stream so far, as far as the famous Willy Bot. Does anybody remember Willy? Uh, so the story behind Willy Bot is uh, essentially, at some point, it seems that the Mt. Gox exchange operators uh, began to realize that they were losing these coins, uh, and they essentially were trying to trade Wash trade market uh, in order to make the funds back. Yeah, one of the many uh, interesting things about this, uh, you know, just uh, this evolving story and just how silly it was. Uh, just imagining that things, uh, you know, like this would happen today. But uh, yeah, the don't Willy forget Bob. Jesus. Oh yeah, Roger Ver. Yeah, but uh, so so basically, um, yeah, that's the long and the short of it is that they they thought that uh, they had the money. It turns out they didn't, and uh, they crafted a document, uh, sent it to investors, and they asked them to bail them out. So uh, they you know they went around uh, looking for investors to replenish their lost Bitcoin funds. Uh, the documents were circulated. Eventually, wound up in the hands of blogger Ryan Selkis, who gets a shout out in our intro video. 
Uh, he uh, published the documents, sold his bitcoins. Uh, personally, I still still blame Ryan a little bit for the for the crash <laughs> thereafter. <laughs> uh, but by midnight, uh, I actually wrote the story for CoinDesk. Uh, now Cox lost three seven hundred and fifty thousand Bitcoin worth three hundred million dollars from there. You know, it really was the story uh, for for a long time. Did either of you guys? Did you guys have uh, accounts at Mt. Gox? Did you know people who did? No, I, I I wasn't I was I wasn't really trading at that that time. Like when when Dow was sort of going down, like as soon as the price started to heat up, and like you know people were starting to have issues with with withdrawals. I'm like you know no more no more sending, <laughs> you know like, mm. and, and then and then we also had Ver coming on and mm-hmm. saying you know i've all i i've checked and they have the money right i'm like <laughs> i mean like you can't as soon as it's it's trust don't verify it's over right this shit's gonna go down those guys remember they were about what they were 50 percent over the 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 spread between them and the other exchanges I yeah, think the, at certain points it, it definitely diverged. I remember the summer of 2013 was when you know because when I joined the industry that was around 2013 and there was rumblings about Mt. Gox. You always heard stories, people whispered about them, but essentially it was still functional. Um, and at that point, you know, I, I remember at least there wasn't really anything different about Mt. Gox. All the exchanges were bad; they were hard to use. Yeah, I, but. I, I, <laughs> But well, you I remember know, signing up for Coinbase, and I, I, you know, I couldn't get an account for for two months, right? Like it was a there was a period where if you signed up over the summer, uh, they were so backed up with new accounts, you, you couldn't get actually get on. I ended up using B two C E, uh, which <laughs> has its own lengthy story, maybe for a for yeah, a live but that's a good site. Else. Yeah. Well, they they uh they did it they did it the right way, I guess, right? Exactly. Yeah. But you know, Coinbase was not an exchange at the time. Coinbase was a brokerage. You just you just put how much you want to buy kind of thing, and there was no sort of like open order book. Uh, there was there was no actual trading on it. Mm. Uh, and uh, Bitstamp, I think, was around. Bitstamp was one of the alternatives, if I remember right. Uh, yeah, I got one. If, if you guys could rank yeah. the exchanges, uh, is Mt. Gox on? Where is it on the list of exchanges of all time? Is it on the top of your list or the bottom of the list? By what um, metric? <laughs> What's yeah? Like, oh, sorry. Exchange hacks. Like, where, where is the Mt. Gox uh, hack in terms of overall severity for the industry? I I think that was like, he crashed the price, but but it, it's not like uh, one. It was kind of expected that something was it was going to crash the price anyways because we were sort of super frothy. Uh, uh, the wash trading bots caused the price to go that high, really. Um, and well, uh, it wasn't just that, right? Because it was for a while you couldn't withdraw dollars or, or yen that's or whatever. Right. You could only get out yeah. through Bitcoin. So you that's had to right. buy. And it was funny. People were like, I don't want to pay the premium. I'm not going to pay $900 of Bitcoin or $1,100 of Bitcoin to get it out. Meanwhile, we're sitting here at 50K um, is like is like pretty crazy. One hack that gets like no notice and, and, and could have been horrible. Was was the 2016 Bitfinex hack? Oh yeah, that was awesome. It was big go last cycle. Yeah, mm. yeah. They lost like everything, and they just they just bull rushed through it, and they somehow got by on the trust of their on their customers, right? But they they were completely insolvent, and they yep. somehow made it out. They did the whole token thing, and then they wash traded their own token, and then they bought back the debt at a discount. I remember it was an incredible recovery there. Yeah, mm. big go threw them under the bus, but it was big go's fault. Like they had this like API with no checks. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like just imagine you're running a service that protects people's coins, right? And then like the API runs loose, like withdrawing everything, like nonstop per second kind of thing. And 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 it's like there's not even a notification of something, right? <laughs> oh, it was Bitfinex fault for not having uh, uh something. Uh, I, I, still well, I mean, rem- if I remember correctly. If I remember correctly, it was a Bitfinex was trying to do a regulatory arbitrage play. So they instead they gave each individual user a yeah. multi-sig wallet. But in practice, it was just multi-sig and name only. It was really right. their all their funds were on hot wallet. Right? But it was and, a hot it multi-sig, right? Green. It was a hot multi-sig. So so but like the second uh, signer yeah. would just sign with no checks. So That's it might right. as well not been multi-sig. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what it was. Yeah. Uh, but you, you know, like I gotta give it to them, right? I mean, they they issued that token that was very sketchy, but but then they made everybody whole. 
I mean, you gotta like, I mean, that's that's like that's like a like MVP recovery right mm-hmm. there. I mean, seriously, yeah, you gotta give it to story. Phil, right? Mm-hmm. Feel is a yeah, fucking rock star. It, 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 all things considered, it's incredible that recovery. So I mean, I remember, right? Yeah, feel feel is you know he kind of invented tether too. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. It's like the guy, the guy definitely know what he's doing. Well, the technology was a lot. You if know, it went uh, into bankruptcy. I, think, I don't think Mt. Gox could have done that, right? I think that there the technology was at a certain stage when that happened in Big Ah, uh, but you know, remember, right? Mt. Gox started as a trading thing for for uh magic the gathering right like it was <laughs> like just just think of that for a second right it was designed for you to trade cards right and, and then it was pivoted into into being the ceo of bitcoin <laughs> like the guy but... yeah talk about like feature right? creep like... Well, like oh now we're going to trade bitcoins with this platform like it's the most crazy well, I mean, there story, was a, there was like... definitely an opening in the market, right? I was talking a little bit about the, er, this earlier on the on the program with Bruce. Uh, you know, the early Bitcoin days, there really weren't exchanges as as we know them today, right? There, it wasn't mm-hmm. actually easy to buy Bitcoins online from an online service. You would think with an online digital currency that there would have been an exchange uh, as soon as the the software was created, but that wasn't the case. They're actually the first Bitcoin exchange isn't created until. Uh, Marty Malmi, who you guys know, maybe know as Sirius at the end of 20, 2009, uh, he launches BitcoinExchange.com. But even a lot of those early exchanges were essentially brokerages. They yeah, they were all brokerages. Bitcoins and they were selling to people. Mt. Gox was really the first, you know, what you would consider order book exchange, right? Somebody puts a bid and an ask. And that's right. Uh, at that time, you know, there just was nothing else, right? There was a uh, Bitcoin asset, uh, not Bitcoin assets, but Bitcoin OTC, right? So you could find somebody peer to peer. There was Shrem in uh, Bitcoin. Yeah, uh, uh, what was Shrem's? Uh, instant. Bit instant. Bit instant. But just so people get a picture of what it was, like there was essentially like you'd go to these websites. There were like not even CSS on them, and, and then and then there was like a, a, a like you, you kind of like a form. You type in your Bitcoin address. You type in the amount you want to buy. You type in like some comment and, and there was a PayPal button on them and, and they wouldn't even it? give you the price that you could get. Like half of them, there was not even like a quote or anything. You, you go and you press send <laughs> and that's it. Process. And you fun, just fun, cross fun your fact, fingers. <laughs> fun fact, uh, July 18th, 2010 was the first uh, Mt. Gox day in business. Uh, 20 Bitcoins were traded at five cents each. Yep. Yeah. Um, volume. The- the first, Our, the first Bitcoin I bought was on BitInstant, uh, Charlie Shrem's thing, and it was basically a front end for Gox. And I remember the price was ripping, and I had to, I filled out the form like you said, I put in the Bitcoin address. It did not give me a price or anything. My fee was insane. It was like a twenty five percent fee. I had to go to like the Western Union phone at like one of the convenience stores, and I had to call it up. And then I waited like three or four days for my Bitcoin to arrive. It was like the most convoluted process. But just one thing I just wanted to mention is the difference between Bitfinex and Mt. Gox is because Mt. Gox came first, I think a lot of people realize like if you go through this bankruptcy process, the coins are almost never going to come out the other side. Mm. So, yep. so, so what happened was like with Mt. Gox, the creditors kind of forced their hand, you know, and Selkis did too, right? He releases this thing. I still think it was kind of questionable that he, he sold his Bitcoin beforehand, but like now jokes on him, right? Like he, he sold Bitcoins at $900. Like, oh. <laughs> well, I'll talk with Ryan about that. I, I think that, I think the issue with that is that he didn't actually publish the documents at the time. So if you remember like the actual timeline of events, I think it was like around 4 PM, he published the blog saying he sold his coins and saying that he had the documents or had seen the documents, but it wasn't really until like 10 PM or 12. Cause there's a reason like the original article was published to like uh, from Coindesk is published at like one in the morning. And I remember like staying up. That was a, like a, that was like a thing. Like the whole writer's room was on. We were trying to get in touch with Mark Arpelis, like with Charlie Sharam, like anybody, you know, who might have been affiliated with that. Uh, but it was a period of hours, right? Like, so it would be the equivalent of somebody today, you know, going out and saying, oh, a, a Coinbase or a Cash App or whatever was hacked, posting no information <laughs> about this, yeah. mind you, telling you that they sold all their coins and then you were just waiting. So, you know, you'd be watching the market, you're, you're watching the charts and, you know, there was, the selling was real, I think. But it was. Gox was, yeah, and Gox was what, 80% of the volume? I think, so by that time it wasn't at peak, Mt. Gox was 80% of the volume, but if you really kind of follow the timeline by summer of 2013, when the prices started to diverge, yeah. you started to see real concern. Coinbase came online in 2013, um, Bitstamp also by that point, I think it raised some funds from Pantera. And yep. was, was doing pretty big business. Um, 
you know, so I, I think Mt. Gox was still very large and it's still, you know, um, it was the number one exchange when people thought about exchanges. Um, but I think by then, you know, because I remember uh, Coindesk also published an article uh, in February about how Mt. Gox was dying, that they were losing their liquidity, that they had the withdrawal issues. Um, so in many ways, I think the industry had some time. But even when it happened, I think the thing was it was just way worse than anybody could have imagined. Well, I remember, uh, right? <laughs> because of their spread was the spread was so high between the, ex the all exchanges and Mt. Gox. Mm. Like if for people that had coins, that was the place to send the coins to sell. Yeah. Right. I mean, like, mm -hmm. you know, like, what, are you going to send to stamp and get six hundred dollars? No, you're going to send to Gox and get like nine hundred to a thousand dollars. for mm -hmm. coin, Right. Right. I right remember yeah. We had we had that that Bitcoin builder service, that that separate service that was allowing people to sell Gox coins for outside Gox coins because hmm. they had the internal transfer mechanism and right. where you can sell to another account. Yeah, I think just a just a crazy time. And, uh, you know, it really felt like at the end of 2013 into early 2014 that, that Bitcoin was like coming out of this early phase, right? Like yeah. you had real investors coming around. Pantera had just put, you know, millions of dollars into Bitcoin. Bitcoin was in the Wall Street Journal headlines, New York Times headlines. Books were, bo book deals were getting signed. Books were coming out. Uh, and then you looked at Mount Guys, you were like, oh, there's no way that this is just all run by one guy who lives with his cat. Like that's, you know, we're surely this is, I think we're better than that at this point. And then when we found out, no, this was one guy who just lived at home with his cat who refused to let any other employees like work on the security of the exchange. You know, it's funny now it's, uh, you know, the big exchanges like Coinbase and Kraken, you know, they have whole teams of people, right? You have people working 24 seven, uh, like hundreds of employees around the world, like dedicated to these things. Uh, and it's funny, Bitcoin, you know, it was a, by the time it was a thousand dollars, that was the state of the exchange market. Um, you know, one of the many things that lags behind the price, right? Even though we see the price going up, that doesn't. Uh, to be you know. fair, though, I, I bet Monk Ox lasted that long because he was a single guy not allowing employees to touch the code base. Remember, mm -hmm. like, you know, one of the cons conspiracies, I mean, like there's there's there. I think it's better than a conspiracy. But like McCaleb, the guy who actually built Monk Ox, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, the story is that the guy had a back door on it. And, and somehow that guy buys like, you know, like a $30 million penthouse, you know, mm -hmm. like in Thailand or something. And it's like, well, like barricaded in it with like drugs and prostitutes. <laughs> one, of know, my favorite, like... uh, one of my favorite stories about the whole thing is you guys remember when uh, Mark Harpolis was a suspect for the Dread Pirate Roberts in the Silk Road trials? Right. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so if, if people don't know Silk Road, Silk Road was one of the big early, I guess what you'd call it a Bitcoin application. It was an it was the biggest yeah, store for uh, for for Go drugs ahead. and legitimate items or all, all sorts of things. Uh, but uh, it was DeFi. You know, famous owner was this Dread <laughs> Pirate Roberts uh, and, and Mark Arpelis, the uh, CEO of Mt. Gox, was uh, ultimately implicated as potentially being him. But uh, presumably can you imagine him. Carpella stroking a cat, having a Starbucks latte, running would have been Silk the Road. Villain, yeah. this, this, absolutely not. Right. I mean, like, mm. uh, his own, he is his own alibi for not being. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have a delay between Pete and us? I think so, but uh, you know, I'm happy to happy to let somebody else ask a question. Chat. No, no, no. I, I just I didn't want to interrupt you. We're still giving the moment. All these silences are just for the victims of Mount Cox. <laughs> it's just a lot to take in and, and to like sort of contextualize it for where it was like. You know, well, a bit you asked yeah. earlier, Pete, like where this ranks as far as all the hacks go. Like mm -hmm. for the time, like this this was the hack of all hacks like mm. nothing's really gonna compare in, in history i mean perhaps if you're measuring the u.s dollar values at, at some time there could be some sort of you know a hack that's bigger than yeah. that but as far as like effect on the industry and, and total bitcoin loss like nothing is ever going to come close yeah i think that's a question i asked to bruce earlier um you know do you ever think a, a bitcoin exchange hack could be as meaningful as the Mt. Gox hack, pass that on to you guys and ask. Probably not. Def definitely not. Like you were saying, no. like you know, seventy or eighty percent of the volume of all trading was happening. Like that alone. Is, no, I, is, I'm not talking about like amount of money. It's just like the the, the Gox, 
Yeah, I mean, exactly. Like Gox was like, you know, most of the volume in Bitcoin, right? Because remember, Japan didn't have like all the KYC laws and like a bunch of the stuff that allowed them to sort of run the exchange there. Uh, and BTC, I mean, you had to be really brave to send yeah. a wire to hey, BTC. I, I did that. <laughs> I actually, I did that. I said I wired and I bought my Litecoin, I'll have you know, and I panic sold it at some point. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, and, and remember, right? Like, I mean, the alternative, aside from those brokerages, were all dying because it depended on on uh, on uh, PayPal, essentially, right? Those were all being essentially taken out. Uh, and, and then we started seeing essentially like only eBay. People were selling mm-hmm. like Bitcoin for four times the price on eBay and people were paying and then not getting the Bitcoin. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah, it was crazy all the hoops we had to hop through. Uh, I don't remember what service I used buying my coins with some friends um it's like moneygram like matt was saying earlier yeah like the, on the phone like western union and you know it's like night and day thinking about all the hoops we had to go through back then compared to you know going today and potentially buying with your credit card your debit card doing mm-hmm. ACA. Well, i think six, i think the other part of the story of mount gox and why it's worth telling again is because the market and the education around the market and, uh, and the understanding of bitcoin is so much different today and i think that's why one of the fun uh, reasons that we keep telling this story is because i think it helps remind newer people of just how far we've come, right? It really was, you had to be pretty dedicated to get Bitcoin back in the day, right? There was Mount Gox. Yeah, and and, and Bitcoin was a means to an end for a lot of the market at that time. Like people were just trying to buy some pot. (laughs) <laughs> like I mean, yeah, realistically exactly. speaking, right? Silk Road mostly, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. But people were not very necessarily like concerned about buying a premium, you know, to buy like pot online, right? Like I mean, it, it was just like it was like a different thing. Like nobody was like like buying Bitcoin to to uh, to to as a store of value and right, sort of right. like yeah, the education it was just piece. Different. You know, I, I'd bring that in too because I, Bitcoin back then most people considered it a, a payment method, you know, digital currency. Uh, th- these were kind of the ways that we talked about it. And, uh, you know, I, also the notion of custody. I asked uh, Bruce earlier, when was the first time that he, you know, really thought that he was custodying his coins? Because, you know, early on you, you ran the Bitcoin software, the Bitcoin software had a wallet and, and that was it, right? The idea of self-custody really evolves over time be- partly because we have exchanges, right? We do use exchanges and they're an important part of, of how Bitcoin is traded. Um, do you guys remember when you custodied your coins? I, I never had any Bitcoin, never bought Bitcoin. I only make and harder visit, for it. Uh, Rod- Rodolfo's boat shack. I clear, I clear in fiat and that's it. Um, yeah, probably in the years that followed really took, uh, more control of stuff other than having like you know this simple uh okay log. so for uh, pers- uh, sorry you go ahead Rodolfo. no 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 go evan i had a really funny tale of uh you know and then our wallets have really come together a long way i, I remember having a backup of a mycelium wallet mm. and uh you know i was moving phones to like a new android and I had inputted my seed, right? And the way that mycelium worked is like after you typed in your seed, it would only pull up the first address, like it wouldn't scan through. So I'm like, yeah. this is only like a fr- this is like a tenth of the Bitcoin I had. What the hell did I do? Did I just lose this all? And I didn't realize you had to go and create your new addresses to recreate yeah. it. There was no HD it. yet. Uh, at some point there, I remember what uh, CoinKite.com. The wallet came out in. Uh... Kind of losing track of time now, well, but there was, I know, think primarily we were using web wallets. There was yeah, that was, that's what the service we offered at that time. Popular. Even Coinbase back then, you know, if you remember, was a wallet. Coinbase was, yep. was a wallet service, uh, and now we have all these things. You look at these these products today. I'm I'm curious if you guys, you know, within the context uh, of what this discussion is about, um, how do you tell people uh, about exchanges today? Uh, has how you're advising people to use exchanges changed over time, or how how do you tell new people about uh, Bitcoin exchanges and how they work. I mean, the the fear of them just like poof disappearing, sort of like lowered, right? So now I essentially say, you know, if you're buying just a few bucks, right, go to the exchange, buy a few bucks, and then get a phone wallet, send a few bucks, and play around with it, get comfortable, and, and then, and then as soon as you're ready to buy a little bit more, like get a harder wallet, get a cold card, and then just deposit on the cold card, and and like essentially never leave money in the exchange unless you're trading, right? 
that's why I made that little website, the, the security, uh, Bitcoin mm-hmm. security dot guide, just right. to follow that. And, and you're good. Right. But like exchanges are not a place for you to keep coins unless you're a trader. Yeah, yeah I absolutely. would say at this point, I, I always advise people who are setting up exchange accounts uh, to, you know, set up a hardware wallet as well as part of their onboarding. Um, I think one of the things for me, without having the ability to, quote, self-custody as we as we think of today, I think it took me a lot longer to really understand Bitcoin. And I do think the process of taking your own keys into possession just enhances your understanding and knowledge of Bitcoin. And, and back then, I think one of the problems we had is we just treated Bitcoin, a lot of the applications, they treated Bitcoin as a number in, a, in an account. That's right. And there wasn't well, really I mean, a way for you to, to withdraw. Mind you, right? On the beginning, there was no HD wallets yet, right? So, so essentially, you had to create one private key per address. Mm-hmm. So initially, people would either deposit the same address always or just have to create yet a new private key, right? And then, and then we launched the HD wallet on, on coinkite.com around like 20 end of 2012 or maybe early 2013 i can't remember around that time and then at least you could like you had a web wallet that you could like just have a single private key that you could just deposit like right. funds right uh, I, think that's, I think that's why like uh describe the way we describe bitcoin is so important right because i think the way that we talk about bitcoin and describe bitcoin helps shape the system itself and back then because it was considered a payments tool a lot of people did think about bitcoin wallets in the same way that you would think about a PayPal wallet That's or, right. or just a square wallet or something that is, was a traditional, um, you know, uh, e-payments. Uh, so uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about how that has changed in your experiences with that. I mean, in day UI, we used to call checking and savings, <laughs> like, you know, like, cause you know, people know online banking, right? So mm-hmm. it's like, that was sort of the concept and, and people were using as payments. They really were right. It was like, like like nearly free payments for something that's uncensorable, right? And that's how mm-hmm. people are using it. And you can buy socks for 40 Bitcoin. You can buy VPN for 50 Bitcoin. You, you know, like th- there was there was just a lot of stuff like that. You know, you could buy, uh, and that's way after the pizza, right? Like we're talking about like, like Three a years. couple of years. Yeah. So uh, I, I think, yeah, it's just like, there were very few people. I think man, I gotta give it to uh, to Trace Mayer. Trace Mayer, I think, was the, essentially like the first person I heard, like making a cohesive argument for Bitcoin store of value and like how you need to like do this thing to keep it forever. No wonder he was an investor on Armory at the time, uh, uh, which was like essentially the one of the first reasonably safe but extremely complicated. So many people lost money because of that wallet, uh, so complicated air gap uh, 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 wallet system, right? Yeah, interesting. So we're, we're we're chatting here about the legacy of Mount Gox. Matt O'Dell lost to the void. Uh, not sure where he is. Hopefully coming back. We've got Rodolfo Novak here uh, at MVK on Twitter and Evan Kaludis. Am I selling, saying that right? Yeah, Kaludis. You got it, Pete. Evan Kaludis uh, at Evan Kaludis on Twitter. Uh, so yeah, we're stream- streaming out to LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, uh, taking questions, uh, Twitch as well. Uh, so talking about education again, thinking about wallets, uh, are there any... Uh, Parts of the Bitcoin system today that you feel like you know we're still kind of dealing with these issues of naming. Uh, I feel still think you know with hardware wallets. You know I'm getting a lot of questions from people these days of just you know really are hardware wallets even wallets at this point? Like I'm not even. Yeah, call, sure. they are not wallets, right? A wallet has chain state. It knows it knows the blockchain. Let's put it this way: they should have been called signing devices, right? Right. right. That's, That's how what I they think are. About them. Yeah. They right. they don't know like Bitcoin. They just know how to sign the stuff right mm-hmm. so but you know it is what it is that name is stuck now and we're gonna live with them forever probably uh but yeah and then and then i think you know and then there is all the layer two stuff that has a bunch of jargon and, and ethereum style naming of things that like hey, i wouldn't really... go that far hey <laughs> it totally is well there are definitely a lot of challenges with ui ux as far as lightning and, and stuff that we're still you know uh, navigating now i mean you know even the words uh, wallet is like a loaded term for something like Zeus. Um, well, I th- yeah, you know, I think that's not really your wallet. It's, it's like an interface to connect to your node that has, mm. you know, the wallet and the keys and the funds on there. Right. Yeah, no, I'm just, I'm just uh, teasing Evan. I know. Yeah. I'm going to get you to, to cave on LN, Rodolfo. You wait. <laughs> it's going to be good right on the CoinKite store. But, uh, yeah, no, I listen, it's going to happen. Like when there is demand, it's going to happen. 
I, I am a, I'm a huge fan, but I think I think I just I've been in this space for long enough now to learn that like there is no point in jumping the gun, especially when it comes to payments, because mm -hmm. you know people don't want to spend their Bitcoin, right? So yeah. uh and one really cool thing is there's a lot of people using Bitcoin to buy stuff from us, to buy cold cards from us, uh using uh uh how do you call it uh, uh strike. So what they do is they they get a, a, a you know a charge on their credit card and they send the Bitcoin direct to our Bitcoin address, right? Yeah. Uh, that's uh, that's very helpful. And you know, Lightning for that kind of stuff is pretty awesome on the settlement side. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think I bought some stuff from you with Strike. Uh, it really goes a long way where you know you don't have to worry about oh uh, spend and replace. Um, yep. And you know, on CoinKite, you get the fees uh, lowered for paying with Bitcoin, so that goes a long way. So yeah. that's really cool to see that in the equation. Yeah, no, it's hard, right? It's hard for us. And, and this, get, I guess, goes back to the conversation about like accepting Bitcoin's payments, right? Uh, you know, we are the bag holders, right, on the exchange rate. So like, mm. you know, we have to keep it to that window. Otherwise, you know, especially the Bitcoin being volatile, it gets tricky. And then we have to send you an email saying, hey, your transaction like confirmed a day later you owe us this much more. <laughs> like, you know. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's not just the liability that you're dealing with. I, I think a lot of the things that we've been learning in this space over the last decade is about incentives. So if you're not giving a user an incentive in terms of a discount and the price, they're you know not going to be likely uh, to be willing to so let go well of it. Yeah, so if you well, do, it could you know make a big difference as on, i'm sure you're seeing on coin right now yeah the way we do it is you are not allowed to buy without tracking or meaning more expensive shipping uh unless like because if you buy a credit card we don't want to do chargebacks right so so we mm -hmm. want the signature so that means you have to use dhl or fedex now if you're using bitcoin we are gladly will send you over snail mail if you're willing to understand the risk of that right but it's super yeah. private right there is no there's no tracking and, you know, you can use an alias and all kinds of stuff. So, yeah, well, I think the lesson there is, you know, we're still thinking about these issues uh, of, of how the Bitcoin system works. And maybe during the math docs times, we needed that reminder where, you know, people really did, it seems, trust Mt. Gox, uh, you know, maybe on the same level as, as a bank or something like that. And uh, people know, kept balances among Gox because they, you know, for all their flaws, I mean, the UI was better than most of the wallets on the market. When Mongox was like, like, you know, I'm not talking about the end of Mongox, right? But like middle there, it was much better than like, I mean, Core was essentially unusable. Uh, uh, and then Electrum came out, right? In 2011, I think. Uh, Electrum was actually quite good uh, as, as like a, a better way, essentially, of, of, of doing Bitcoin locally, right? Uh, people, I think Coinbase on the beginning, you couldn't even keep a balance there. You had to just uh, buy initially. And then they they open the wallet. Well, I think like the thing that people you know who maybe weren't around at that time is there was just a tremendous flux in how we were using Bitcoin and how people were understanding it, and that's why I went to at the beginning of maybe this intro we were talking about descriptions and, and how important it is to describe you know how a system should be uh, to keep the parts in harmony. And I think you know back then to most people you know Bitcoin was an app that was in your tray. It looked like something like a Skype. Or, you know, uh, something that you would just see on your computer and that you were running all the time. And we don't really have that relationship with the Bitcoin software today. Um, or at least, you know, some of us. I see, I see Evan with a little bit of a laugh over there. Um, I guess maybe you can think about, uh, you know, how, I guess, how do you guys think about that evolution? Well, I think the difference is like the software now is like professional, right? So like, you, you know, you're not going to have a My Wallet situation where, you know, essentially, like they, they keep the secrets on the URL, and Google uh, started like caching the URLs, and therefore all Bitcoins are lost, right? Like, <laughs> you know, you don't have like issues with, like, for example, uh, a blockchain.info, right? Where like the morons were, were not like uh, giving random K values, essentially like making all the wallets like poundable, right? Like, it, like the, the level of, of bad was really bad because you had like web devs doing like security dev, right? Now it's like, you know, you have like good libraries to use for cryptography related to Bitcoin. You have like, like you know, you have examples of, of even if you're not going to use the library, like you have like just good examples on how to do certain things. People also realize that you cannot keep keys hot. 
you know, like people used to have their wallet.dat files from, from Bitcoin Core stolen, right? Like, mm. it, you know, everything is encrypted. Everything is sort of like kept, like sanitized. It's just like, you know, harder wallets essentially like removed 99% of the risk mm. by just like not having the keys on a computer. Right. Well, look, at the yeah, end of the day, I mean, there is no recourse in the Bitcoin system, right? You, you have to trust yourself. And I, I think that's one of the reasons why we keep telling these exchange stories. We mentioned Mt. Gox, we mentioned Bitfinex. I, I saw in the comments <laughs> here on some of these channels, people were mentioning KuCoin and, and Binance, and we do see them see them often. Uh, do you guys think we're going to get to, like, what does the future look like there? Are we getting slowly to to a place where, where these sort of centralized exchanges are, are not going to be a part of the system? Do we have to just learn how to treat them more effectively? Where does the change occur? Does it occur at the technology level or does it occur in the education and user level or, or both? I think we're always going to have like some sort of centralized custodians uh, as far as exchanges. Um, you know, we've really seen like a proliferation of these DEXs and places, but, you know, you're not going to have the same level of efficiency there. Um, and, you know, we're also still always going to have custodians like as much as we preach, um, you know, personal accountability and self-sovereignty, uh, you know, those those things are like cheaper and easier to do than ever, but there are always gonna be people that aren't ready for that. They don't have the knowledge, they don't wanna take the risk. So it's hard to see us uh, things, you know, completely going away from that. But at the same time, um, you know, we've had all these expensive lessons over time, unfortunately. But, and the custodians are getting better and better from, you know, implementing multi-sig to putting funds in cold storage uh, to, you know, having better auditability tools, like tools that would have caught these, uh, you know, funds being siphoned off from the Mt. Gox wallet. Things yeah. are constantly improving on, on those domains. It's, it's going to be the Pareto uh, distribution, right? We're going to essentially keep on, because this is a human problem. It's not a Bitcoin problem. Like we're always gonna have eighty percent of the people getting screwed or screwing themselves, right? And like twenty percent of the people at least try to investigate if it's worth trying to do something, uh, and, and maybe ten percent sort of take on custody, right? So I, I don't oh, think I don't is. think we're escaping any of that. He's back. Hey, hey, what's up, Matt? Hey, my whole, my whole internet blew up. I apologize. Gotta have no worries. We've been having some good discourse internet. over here. Uh, but yeah, like the distribution of these exchanges, at least they've been like, you know, we're not dealing with an exchange that has 70% of the volume anymore. And, uh, you know, CK was telling us in the chat, um, you know, as far as dollar terms and hacks, like KuCoin was a bigger hack in terms of US dollars, as well as the Bitfinex. Mm. Oh, but yeah. they didn't have as much of an impact as on the industry as Mt. Gox. Right. And as time wow. goes on and things get more distributed, yeah, we might have some crazier hacks with bigger U.S. dollar values, but as things get more and more dispersed, they're going to have less of an effect well, on the industry. I think the, the risk with Mt. Gox that we, we haven't really touched on was there was always the risk of the regulatory backlash, right? Because with Mt. Gox, you really had for the first time a number of consumers, right? Mt. Gox had 120,000 customers or clients, right? Uh that level of people who, who were demanding that, that something happen, right? There were government agencies getting involved, uh, whether in Japan or the US, there was law firms getting involved. Um, and that reaction, um, you know, I'm curious how you guys feel about how, about how we made out there. I mean, there was a lot of, you know, talk at that time about, about there being very heavy regulations on, uh, on Bitcoin. And you could argue that maybe with the bit license and, and some of these things that they did happen, I'm curious what you think of the legacy of, of Mt. Gox on, on the regulatory side. I think we were let off easy, like in terms of like Bitcoin space, because it was just so small that like regulators sort of made some noise, but like not a lot came out of it immediately. And like, and, and Mt. Gox was fully kosher regulatory wise in Japan, right? Like Japan never had this crazy laws we have in North America about money. I mean, this is a cash society anyways. Um, so, so yeah, like I think was a bit overblown, uh, and, and then, you know, and then there is New York, but New York has always been sort of like a, a totalitarian state when it comes to money. <laughs> Remember like all the exchanges were essentially saying, you know, everyone, but North Korea and North and New York can come in. Yeah. Don't even get me started as someone from New York, uh, 
<laughs> you know, bit license really held a lot of things back in, in New York uh, for what was essentially, you know, cronyism with this guy, Ben Lasky, putting these laws forward through the New York Department of Financial Services and then leaving a couple of years later to, you know, just guide companies through the process of getting their license, which, you know, would run you, you know, a million and a half plus at least. He joined the board of Ripple. <laughs> That's right. He yeah. owned Bitcoin and then he joined Ripple. Unbelievable. Just completely unethical. But his his whole his whole excuse and justification for the bit license was Mount Gox. It was the Gox collapse that they used as the justification for that shit. What was it? About six months to a year after the R3 group was formed. Uh mm -hmm. so so like you know, that was sort of like the bank's answer to try to pretend they're gonna do something with blockchain technology. Uh, that that's exactly like, because you know that's that was the perfect excuse. Like, look at Bitcoin; it's for criminals and it's stolen all the time. Let's do only blockchain, and that was like the trend. If you were like in, an executive or in tech, like if you were not saying blockchain, 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 you'd get fired. And Kodak like did some blockchain shit around that time too, right? Uh, yeah, they were. Talking about putting out a miner, uh, I forget the code, cash miner with a K. Something they, like that. never got released. Oh, man. But yeah, I mean, we still really haven't gotten over that hump. There's like still countless people out there that have this misconception blockchain, not Bitcoin. I was going to say, like, to if, you, if you look back at the history, why that doesn't work. <laughs> you know, we've talked about all these things in this chat about all the good things that have come out of Mt. Gox, right? The exchanges have gotten better. There are certainly more exchanges. Uh, Self-custody is an idea, and, and for, for a lot of people, it became a passion, and, uh, you know, companies started, uh, technologies were formed. Did we need something like Mt. Gox? If you could have a magic wand no. and you could go and erase it, would you would We you didn't need it. We didn't need it. No. No, because there was enough people, like, there were enough people getting hacked every day, right, from the current solutions that, like, the the, the 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 solutions were coming out anyways right for you to uh uh for you to to sort of do security right the the gox thing was just sort of like a cherry on top it was just the cream to to really destroy a lot of the businesses that needed the capital but remember people had to survive the bear market after that which was brutal how many bitcoin companies went under um, and how many Bitcoin companies, essentially all the, all the, the wallet companies became shitcoin companies because that's how they made their money after. Yeah. I mean, there's always going to be hacks in some regard or another, but you know, it, it would have been nice if, uh, such a central player in the ecosystem didn't go down like that. You know, it would, things would have panned out differently. Adoption could have been different. Uh, you know. Other things could have been funded by holders who actually kept their coins. Um, you know, there's still so many people that haven't been made whole, even in terms of the U.S. dollar value back then. So, um, yeah, we wouldn't have been better off without it. It looks like caps. It gave us way more time to stack. It gave yeah. us way more time to stack because it happened. Hey, oh, Cap, cap Sodell, you're going to need to turn off your video there. It's breaking up. Yeah, everyone's got to give uh, Cut Matt some slack. He's like going off some satellite internet and some remote location. Who who even knows where this guy is? Maybe it's just a, a studio. You know, it's a pretend uh, as a pretend uh, his uh, room optics, there. His, his optics, he, I, I don't know. Green screens are really cheap nowadays. Who knows? But it's hard to it's hard to mimic that natural light though. So I got a, I got another one. Uh, is Mark Carpellis a, a villain in the Bitcoin story? I think he was taken for a ride and then he did the best that he could to keep that going as a business person. Um, I, you know, it, it's really hard to say there could have perhaps been incompetence, right. But at least he, you know, stood his ground. He didn't run away anywhere. Yeah. He, he did prison he time. He went down with the ship. Yeah. That's yeah. True. He went down with the <laughs> ship. So for that, I, I tip my hat to Mark. I think he probably did his best with, uh, you know, what, what with the back door he was for. given. Could you imagine <laughs> with the that? Back could, door you, could you imagine given? that? Could you imagine running an exchange and then just opening your computer one day? And, and it's like, poof, 
all of the coins that for all your customers well, and, and like how would you even bought that many coins back at that point right no you I, can't like it's it's bankruptcy period like there is no nope. recovery yeah can you guys hear me mm -hmm. yeah barely there was fraud there was fraud at the end at the end there was fraud he tried to cover it up and he also blamed the Bitcoin network, which I'll never forgive him for blaming the Bitcoin <laughs> oh, network. Uh, yeah. Transaction, transaction, transaction malleability. malleability, right? That's what it was. Right. Yeah, but but you know, like I, again, right? Like I mean, you have to put the stuff in context to the times, right? This is a kid, okay, running a a like hundred million dollar like thing that that like he's just trying to keep it together, has no clue what he's doing, right? And there is a back door in the system that takes all the funds away. Like, you know, and then like, how does he deal with investors? And like, it's just, you know, like, I mean, if you have a chance, I highly recommend, okay, go and watch the YouTube video of him giving his deposition to mm. this weird Japanese court mm. where he's like wearing a suit and he bows in and right, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see in his eyes, man. Like, it's like, you can see a kid who just fucked up and like crashed father's car, right? And is like now having to answer for it. Like it's priceless. Yeah, yeah. It's just like everything that I've seen from him, you know, not to discount the the flooding the network or, mm. you know, the fraud being covered up, but nothing sh struck me as like that, that he did this intentionally, mm. to, uh, you know, profit on his own. Like it, it, I mean, every, he his actions there struck me as genuine. He's not living in Thailand in a $30 million penthouse, right? Mm. Exactly. We've seen much worse cases of people taking advantage of situations like this for, you know, their own edification and for profit. Mm. What would you say to someone who lost Bitcoins in Mt. Gox and never came back to Bitcoin? Not your keys, not your funds, but, you know, better buy Bitcoin now than yeah. have to buy Bitcoin later at a higher price. Yeah, it's still sort of early, and if you're not back now, you're going to be back at some point. Um, I have a variation now, is okay. have fun buy, buying higher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's my feeling on it. These people will all be back. It's just a shame that, you know, they could have bought in the giant crash afterwards. It's, but, you know, there's so many people that were overextended. They lost their life savings. You know, you, you got to be uh, empathetic to uh, to a lot of these people. Matt, what say you? Uh, you know, fucking stay humble and stack sats, guys. Like, buy some Bitcoin. You know, you're not late. I, everyone thinks you're late. I still think I was late. People think I was way early. I, I was late when I bought Bitcoin. There's, there's, there's never, you cannot be late to an asset that's designed to pump forever. Everybody feels late. It doesn't matter when they buy and they keep on buying. It just always feels late. Yeah, it's like you, you always feel like you're late and you always feel like you don't have enough. And yeah. that applies to me. That applies to the pleb that bought yesterday. That applies to the guy who got in on this day two. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, we, we all have to come to terms with... Uh, you know, the, the mechanics of, of the system. And, uh, you know, there's just some things that, uh, you know, they, they are what they are. Mm -hmm. But again, the, the best day, time to stack was, you know, yesterday. The second best time to stack is today. So get to yep. it. Well, guys, we're coming up on the end of uh, our Bitcoin Magazine live stream here, The Legacy of Mount Gox. Want to do some final thoughts uh, about this historical event celebrating our seventh anniversary, or I don't know if it's celebrating, we're, we're marking the occasion. A Tony. Uh, <laughs> uh, final thoughts, Rodolfo, let's, let's start with you. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, like, I, I think it's just like, it's just a nice remind, uh, just right. Uh, a nice reminder. And, and I like to make this reminder every time the price goes up, it's like, get your shit together with your security, always secure your coins as if the price was 10 times what it is at the time you're looking at your security, right? Because you will probably jump to that much, right? And, and like, there is nothing as practical as just get a harder wallet, even if it's not a good one, even if it's not mine. Um, like, any harder wallet is better than no harder wallet, 
Okay. And, and this is, this is like good advice for 99% of people, right? If you're advanced, lots of cool shit you can do. If, if, you know, like don't overcomplicate things, just make sure like you have a metal backup of your thing and you have a harder wallet, you're 99% there. And then if you want to spend some time learning more, there's a bunch of other cool stuff you can do, but don't overcomplicate because that's how people lose most of their money. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's totally on the money technology that allows self custody like nothing before. Uh, you can't self custody your stocks in the same way. You can't self custody or transfer your, uh, your own gold in the same way without exorbitant costs. Um, you know, Satoshi made it very easy to take things into your own hands. So you should do it. Caps Odell, final thoughts. Remember Mt. Gox when you consider trying to time the top and of this cycle and move funds on exchanges and risk that because there's some fuckers who, who successfully sold the top. They thought they successfully sold the top of, the, of that cycle. And meanwhile, they have no Bitcoin and Bitcoin's at $50,000. Yep. Wise yeah, words. All right. Thanks guys for coming. Uh, you can find once again, this whole stream, uh, we'll, you know, you can find it on YouTube. Uh, it'll be on Twitter, on LinkedIn, uh, and, uh, last on Twitch. If you want to rewatch any of the great moments or follow any of the guys here, would encourage you to check them out on Twitter, uh, and follow their work. Uh, I guess that's it for us until next year. We'll be celebrating the, we're marking the eighth year of Mount Gox. Uh, we'll see. Yeah, time flies. Take care guys. Take care. Peace. many places to buy Bitcoin. They collect your personal information and jeopardize your privacy. KYC is the illicit activity. BISC is open source. It does not collect user data. You keep your private keys, create or take offers to trade peer to peer, and keep your Bitcoin private and secure. Welcome to the Bitcoin Twitch channel, hosted by Bitcoin Magazine. I'm Don, one of the co-hosts of The Marble Show. Join myself, Flip, and Tommy for exciting marble racing simulations and talk about the latest news in Bitcoin. We also run giveaways and promotions that dole out sweet, sweet Satoshis. Follow and subscribe to the Bitcoin Twitch channel, have fun playing games with other Bitcoiners, and maybe you'll find yourself with a few more Satoshis in your pocket.